Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the seventh meeting of the Justice Committee in 2015? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile, mobile phones and other electronic devices completely as they interfere with broadcasting even when they're switched to silent? Gil Pattis will be delayed because he's at the Public Petitions Committee. will come shortly. Um, we may be joined by other MSPs. We'll see. Uh, I know there's other MSPs been interested in the topic of uh, trafficking. Uh, Jenny Mara and Christina McKelvey, uh, they may make this. They have other commitments. I know that. Uh, item one in private, invited to agree. Item five, our next steps on agricultural crime in private. Are you agreed? And I do welcome Jenny. Do take a seat, Jenny. I don't know where you're going to... We've got a seat. There we are. Uh, item two, Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill. This is our first evidence session on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill, which, as you can see, has been held in roundtable format. And I'd say to witnesses that we did go out, three, we split into three groups to do some initial um, informal evidence taking. I welcome each of you to the session. Can I say that really the purpose is to allow you, the witnesses, to interact and give evidence, but please interact through the chair. Uh, just indicate to me, uh, either by a, a, a strong glint in your eye or a wave of a finger or something, we'll take a note and I'll let you know where you are. That's how it works. And when, you, when I call you, your um, microphone will come on automatically. You'll see the wee red light round here at the top cuff will come on to see that you are actually called. You don't need to push anything. We're a very good recording man here. He'll make sure that you're heard. Um, I'm going to go around so we can all introduce each other and where we come from. And I'll go anti-clockwise, and this week I'll remember what anti-clockwise means. <laughs> I'm Christine Graham, I chair of the Justice Committee, and I'm a member from Midlothian, South Tweeddale and Lauderdale. Elaine Murray, Vice uh, Convener of the Justice Committee, member for Dumfrieshire. Uh, Gordon MacDonald, and I'm representing Abolition Scotland. Margaret Mitchell, member for uh, Central Scotland. Lisa Gamble from Bernardus, Scotland. Uh, Roderick Campbell, MSP for North East Fife. Christopher Gold from Migrant Help. Chloe Swift, representing Scotland's Commission for Children and Young People. Jenny Mara, MSP. Gina McSween from the Scottish Guardianship Service. Christian Ahad, MSP for North East Scotland. Graham O'Neill from the Scottish Refugee Council. John Finney, MSP, Highlands and Islands. Pam, <coughs> Pam Cairns, Scottish Theroptimus. Alison McInnes, MSP, North East Scotland. Brona Andrew, Community Safety Glasgow's Tara Service. Jane Baxter, MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife. Nicola Mary from Victim Support Scotland. Did you see all the red lights coming on, you see? So that was a good little <laughs> rehearsal. Um, so before us, we have the bill, and the evidence today, of course, is to assist us in what is good, bad, and indifferent about the bill. So I'll just ask someone to kick off, someone want to start, just indicate to me if you want to make any comments. Thank, by the way, thank you for written submissions. Um, Lisa Gamble, please. Uh, welcome to the bill, um, and we were glad of the visit from the Justice Committee members. Uh, however, there are some areas which we do believe need some strengthening. Um, mainly, we'd like to see a definition of a child for the purpose of the bill in the legislation as any person who is under the age of 18 years. And we'd like to see a clause in presumption of age. Um, we'd like clarity around the provision for trafficked children on the face of the bill, and in particular what the provision should be for 16, 17-year-olds. We'd like to see the introduction of independent guardians on a statutory fitting for children who are, are or are suspected of having been trafficked. <laughs> We'd like to see provision for a statutory defence for children in addition to Lord Advocate guidelines on the presumption of non-prosecution. And finally, we'd like to see an additional statutory aggravation to recognise both the vulnerability of child victims of trafficking and the seriousness of the offence of trafficking when it's against a child and to be considered at the stage of sentencing. And we'd be happy to discuss any of these issues with the committees. Does anybody else want to discuss it with? Anybody else want to come in any of these issues? Gordon MacDonald, please. Yes, I mean, there's three issues that we would raise. Um, the first is um, the need to look at criminalising demand for the purchase of sex, which has been done in Sweden and Norway. Um, Northern Irish Assembly has just passed a law um, to do that as well. Um, that um, has been shown to reduce um, demand for um, a paid for sex and also uh, reduce human trafficking as well in those jurisdictions that have done it. Um, secondly, um, like Bernardo's, we would like to see a statutory basis for child trafficking guardians. Um, uh, 
put in law rather than just a, on, a, on a policy basis or a voluntary basis. Um, and then the third point is improved survivor services, um, and in particular um, looking at perhaps extending the period of time which is available for from 45 days to 90 days, and also um, ensuring that there is um, adequate provision for survivors. Thanks. Chloe Swift. Um, like Bernard of Scotland, uh, we broadly welcome the introduction of the bill. Um, for us, we are really uh, keen to ensure that the bill embeds a rights-based approach into policy and practice, um, and that the bill fully recognises the particular vulnerability of children who've been trafficked. Um, I want to highlight the Article 35 and Article 39 of the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child, um, which talks about preventing the abduction and sale of uh, or traffic in children and um, promotes physical and psychological recovery and social integration of children, child victims. The way that we see this happening is by having a clear definition of a child as under 18 years of age on the bill, a consolidation of existing legislation relating to children, um, a clause on the best interests of the child, um, provision for independent guardians, um, and clarity over provision for 16 and 17-year-olds, including a presumption of age. Um, and finally, a consideration of a provision for a statutory defence of children who are victim, for children who are victims of trafficking. Yes, Nicola Merman. Hi there. Um, thank you for inviting us to speak today. Um, we warmly welcome the bill, as we believe this is a great opportunity for victims who have been trafficked or exploited to receive this, the support they need, how and when they need it. Um, we also have a few points that we'd like to raise today, however. Um, firstly, we would like to raise our concerns about the vulnerability factors in the bill. Um, we feel they are too prescriptive and simplistic and therefore do not take into account all of the ways that um, a victim can be exploited um, and can be vulnerable. Sorry. The second point we would like to raise is in relation to the non-prosecution of victims. Um, although we are pleased that the Lord Advocate has guidance on this, um, on the presumption not to prosecute a victim who has committed a crime um, as a result of their, their victimisation, their trafficking, we feel that other legislation, the Northern Irish legislation and the English legislation, um, have stronger provisions in this area. And we agree that we would like to see um, statutory defence on the bill, as well as the Lord Advocate's guidance. The fundamental issue for us, however, is to ensure that adequate and timely support is provided to victims. Um, although we understand that most of the work will be done through the strategy, which we warmly welcome as well, um, we think there's a chance within the bill to ensure that support is provided as soon as, is, as possible and as soon as is needed. Um, we feel strongly that support should not be dependent on the NRM process, on immigration status, on anything other than the need of the victim. Um, and this specifically relates mostly to, again, as, as Gordon had said, um, the time frame and providing support to victims before they get the chance to decide whether they want to go on through the NRM process or report to authorities. Um, I think that's all for now. You're not welcome. <laughs> so now, Ron, Andrew, please. Um, again, we welcome the introduction of the bill. We're supportive of uh, some of the issues that our colleagues have already raised, including the presumption of age and the non-prosecution principle. We would, however, like to see the means element of human trafficking reflected within the bill. Um, we're, we're also seeking clarification around... Okay, for order to, and all the international definitions of human trafficking have three key elements. So there's the act, which is covered by uh, the offence in terms of recruitment, transportation, harbouring, receipt of a person. Then there is the means, how the traffickers do this, and that is through coercion, deception, and in particular, the abuse of a position of vulnerability. We would be really keen to see that reflected within the bill. In terms of uh, support for victims, we're seeking clarification around the, the bill and whether support for victims will be dependent on entry into the national referral mechanism. We're also seeking clarity around um, the period before an adult consents to enter into the NRM, if support will be available um, for, for that period um, as well. And finally, we are again supportive of the, the calls to criminalise demand for the purchase of sex. Our experience over 10 years has very clearly evidenced to us the strong links between the sex industry and women being trafficked to meet the demand. 
Yes, you want to come in. Dr Pamela Cairns, please. Um, I represent Stroptimus International. For those of you who don't know, Stroptimus is a worldwide uh, women's organisation that seeks to improve the lives of women and girls. And uh, by far the majority of victims of trafficking are, in fact, uh, women and children. And uh, we would welcome this bill very much. Um, we would like to see uh, the criminalisation of the purchase of sex because most trafficking, a, a large percentage of trafficking, is about um, sexual exploitation. Uh, and we really would like to see uh, this stop because it's about supply and demand. And if we cut the demand, it will cut the supply. One of our fears is that if, uh, as Northern Ireland has um, criminalised the purchase of sex, that um, those uh, wanting to be involved in that will move across to Scotland, uh, unless we have strong, robust laws uh, to pre protect our people. Thank you. I've got... Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Christopher Gould. Um, again, uh, my going to help we warmly welcome the bill. Um, the, what we'd like to see is the under the issue of repatriation is a uh, a long term strategy and a framework around safe repatriation. If victims voluntarily choose to return home, there's currently no strategy, um, and it's uh, quite an ad hoc process. Um, and we'd like to see that addressed in the bill, as well as um, the issue on data sharing with Police Scotland. We'd like more information around that, what that could look like. Um, but we welcome the concept of it. We just need a bit more information. Thank you very much. I've got, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, Graham O'Neill, please. I represent the Scottish Refugee Council and uh, we warmly welcome the bill. Uh, we think it marks a culmination of uh, leadership from Scotland's human rights community, uh, a number of politicians and in, in, in the department and now the government in, in trying to, you know, important marker in our journey in relation to tackling slavery. Um, there's a lot that's good in this, this, le this legislation. Um, some of the things that strike us is the strategy is, is, is very important because what the strategy is about is, to, is about Scotland working together to take responsibility against this crime. And if anybody knows in and around how trafficking occurs, is that it's manifesting geographically in different parts of the country as well as across sectors. It's, it's a symptom of, in many ways, of how of how we live in developed Western economies. So, the strategy is about getting all your different sectors together to to to, to take leadership and 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 build up their knowledge and, and intelligence of of the issue. And um, it's 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 commendable that the Scottish government have put that down as a legal duty uh, to the Parliament, a reporting duty to the Parliament, to the strategy. So, we particularly welcome that because we think. That will be the vehicle for the long-term approach that we need to get if we're going to tackle this 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 particularly severe uh, crime and human rights violation. Um, at Scottish Refugee Council, we work uh, in the international protection world, uh, particularly but not only in relation to asylum seekers, and we um, we we know that. That, that, that part of the experience for people in the asylum process, who are often people who are deeply resilient but very vulnerable circumstances, are that they are subject to, they're taken advantage of and subject to exploitation. So for over 10 years, at least now, we've worked uh, with a number of key partners, notably Tara, uh, who are the, the pioneering organisation in relation to this area in Scotland, working with survivors, um, you know, helping, um, helping uh, it's people that have suffered um, traffic to exploitation and um, one of the deep frustrations for us as, as for many others has been the conflation between trafficking and immigration uh, and yes, yeah and I think that, that that's that's to be welcome and thankfully that's now happening at the UK level is decoupling those two processes because trafficking is essentially crime and human rights violation uh, and only secondarily and sometimes issues around immigration so we welcome that the fact that we are taking dedicated legislation in relation to crime and human rights violation, and we think there's a logic in relation to this bill, particularly in terms of survivors, in relation to the very welcome step that the Scottish ministers have taken and placed themselves under a duty to provide support and assistance to survivors. So that's a very concrete step of Scotland taking control of what happens to survivors. And when I say logic, I think there's a real logic about developing a Scotland-based identification process as well, uh, which gets away from the current process, which is too legalistic. 
and is confined to decision making for organisations that are set up for different purposes, i.e., border control or combat and serious and organised crime. So we very much welcome the, the provisions within the, the bill around survivors, and we would like to see them developed as the parliamentary process goes through to have more of a Scotland based identification process as well. And at the other end, for survivors, we'd like to see more control being taken in Scotland in relation to enabling the fullest possible recovery of survivors uh, due to their personal circumstances and or if they're assisting with relevant legal proceedings, criminal proceedings or proceedings related to them, you know, for example, compensation. Uh, so I suppose what we're trying to say is that the bill is a really important step in terms of Scotland developing a holistic approach to survivors from identification, assistance and recovery. So we very much welcome that step and we'd hope that that can be worked through as, as the parliamentary process develops. In relation to non-prosecution and penalisation of survivors, that's a, that's a key principle in relation to international law and, and trafficking. Indeed, it's a key principle in relation to criminal responsibility and preserving that. And we see this from first principles that this provision is about survivor rights fundamentally, nothing to do with immunity, and I don't think anybody's considering it in relation to immunity from prosecution, but it is a key survivor right. Secondly, it's integral to criminal procedure and law because it's integral to the principle of criminal responsibility. So we see that as a real important way to conceptualise this particular principle. Uh, thirdly, it's a prerequisite to getting at the people we want to get at in terms of particularly organised criminals because survivors are potential witnesses. They are the ones that will give you your lines of inquiry, etc. So we think that the statutory guidelines are a welcome first step in relation to this, this, uh, this crime, but we think they need to be strengthened on the face of the bill. Uh, not to get at the independence of the Lord Advocate, because that's a key tenet of Scots, the Scots system, but to... to defence. We are in favour of yeah. statutory offence as well. We do not see this as an either-or. We don't think that you don't have statutory guidelines which are about prevention and, those, and, and a statutory offence which provide that additional safeguard for individuals when the system, for one, whatever reason, breaks down. You know, so we don't see it as mutually exclusive. We see them actually as part of a holistic The Law approach. Society and the Faculty also, I think, submit yeah. they agree with the statutory defence. But one thing, to pick up one thing, which was the conflating it with immigration, I know when Alison McInnes, myself and John Finney at Bernardo's, it was drawn to our attention about domestic trafficking, which somehow is not the major part, but slips off the agenda. And is that part of what you're saying as well, that we focus too much on it being an immigration issue instead of it being... That's been one of the problems. That's been one of the, the, the symptoms of this inappropriate yeah. conflation of what's a human rights yeah. abuse with immigration. Immigration is a secondary consideration. Uh, what matters is... Has this the question that people need to direct their minds to? Has this person suffered a human rights violation that we are calling traffic to exploitation? And what should be done to assist that individual from the recovery? That's at the moment what we've got is organisations who are having who are conflicted, particularly the UK Border Agency. Right, I'm going to um, see no other witnesses at the moment. So, I beg your pardon, Katrina McSween. Um, I just want to uh, reiterate some of the points that's already been raised. Um, so I'm here representing Abler and the Scottish Guardianship Service, and I'm responsible for delivering the kind of day-to-day -day operations for uh, working with child victims of trafficking. And I'm also a guardian to some uh, child victims of trafficking. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to just raise some of the operational issues, that some of the points that have been raised in terms of being more uh, explicit about... You know, from out with, out with EU. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so all of the children we work with have got an immigration element to their case. Um, so it's really important that a clear definition is um, it's more explicit about what is a child um, because it is an issue that comes up time and time again, particularly for 16 and 17 year olds. <coughs> um, I think there needs to be a, a duty to refer to the service to give guardians a more statutory footing because at the moment, uh, in practice, we're still very much um, an invited party to meetings and information sharing and it really um, impedes us in being able to do our job um, in supporting victims of trafficking. So I think it would be it's really important to have that uh, duty to refer uh, to have a guardian for trafficked children. 
I also agree with uh, some of the points about um, creation of uh, statutory defence as an additional safeguard, because I have seen um, many children being put through the criminal justice process, having um, been criminalised for activities they've been forced to undertake. Um, and I also think that support needs to be more explicit in the bill about um, what traffic children should be provided with um, within the Children of Scotland Act. Um, I think there's been a lot of um, disparity across the Sc Scotland, we cover the whole of Scotland, and children get treated very differently in different local authorities, so I think it needs to be more explicit within the bill. Please. Um, up until recently, it took a lot of advocacy on our part and other agencies, but a lot of children, when they arrive at 16 and 17, quite often, often will be um, accommodated under Section 22 of the Children's Scotland uh, Act 1995, opposed to the Section 25, which would treat them as a looked after and accommodated child, which means that they do not receive the same kind of level of care in terms of um, access to Section 29, like leaving care services and support. And quite often we've seen children being discharged of care at 18. Um, so it does cause um, a lot of problems in terms of there's lack of like, pathways planning for children as well when they're being treated under Section 22 of the Children in Scotland Act. So I think it needs to be more explicit because, as I say, it all depends on what local authority you happen to present in because they do interpret the law very differently. And it's been a point of advocacy for the guardians for a number of years now. OK. I've, uh, yes, Liz. I've, by the way, I've got Alison and Christian. I have noticed you, but I'll take uh, um, Lisa Gamble first. Uh, just an opportunity to echo what um, the Scottish Guardianship Service are calling for. And we would really like to see the issue of 16, 17-year-olds and provision for them clarified within the legislation by bringing the relevant provisions of the Children's Scotland Act into the face of the bill. And we have... Uh, we'd like to see a provision within the bill um, which may read something like this, which would ensure that a child where there's a suspicion um, that they are a victim of trafficking and who is 16 but is under 18 and appears to require accommodation, has no one with parental responsibility for them, is lost or abandoned, or there is no one who can provide suitable care for the child and the child wishes to be accommodated, then the local authority must provide such accommodation under... Section 25 of the Children's Scotland 1995 Act. Okay. Does anybody else wish to come in as witnesses first before I move on? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that the Children's Commission is fully supportive of that um, clarity over provision for 16 and 17 year olds. It's something that we've um, been aware of. The commission. It's been brought to the Commissioner's attention um, and we're certainly very supportive of ensuring that Section 25 of the Children's Act 1995 is used. Um, and it's something that we know has been highlighted by Police Scotland, um, by the Legal Services Agency and by others in their, their evidence as well. Thank you. Gil Patterson, just thanks very much, Gil, for coming back from petitions. Um, I've now, if that's all witnesses, for the time being, I'll take uh, Alison, please. Uh, obviously, and quite rightly, there's been a, a strong focus this morning um, from, from the outset on, on children and, and the lack in the bill at the moment. Um, of course, determining age can be very difficult without um, proper documentation. Both Lisa and Chloe, I think, talked about presumption of age. I just wondered if they could um, perhaps elaborate a little bit more on what they're looking for there. Yeah, so, um... uh, yes, Lisa. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's OK. <laughs> um... So, really, a definition of a child has been under 18. It would naturally follow on because of the circumstances that a child victim of trafficking is often not clear when they come into the country what their age is. We think that there does need to be a clause on presumption of age, which would state that where a person who is suspected of being a victim of trafficking and there's reason to believe that they may un be under 18, that they should be treated as a child. So the bill should specify that until an age assessment of that person's age has been carried out by a local authority, a public authority must assume that a person is younger than 18, as in a child. And that is in the Modern Slavery Bill and also in the Northern Ireland Act. I was going to say, is there a, does this operate somewhere else, even in common law, apart from in statute? I'm not sure about common law, but certainly the England, Wales and Northern Ireland legislation and trafficking. 
Yeah, we, we are certainly um, very supportive of, of reference to presumption of age. We, we've been very clear in our evidence about um, needing a definition for child as under 18. Um, we note in the child impact assessment produced by the Scottish Government um, that there's some concern about um, that there's a specific line around um, individuals of an unknown age uh, receiving services. Um, we think it's particularly important that um, systems are in place uh, to ensure that um, child victims can be um, provided with services um, as when they're defined as under 18 years of age until an age assessment has concluded. Um, particularly, we consider this to be important in cases where there may be a lengthy wait for an age assessment and is in line with, uh, as Lisa said, the, the um, requirements in the EU directive on trafficking and with part five of the modern slavery bill. supporting children we're saying I understand that there is an obligation under the Council of Europe Convention and the EU directive it, it impacts as somebody who manages a service for adult victims over the years we have had women referred to us who have been assessed as being older than the state um, and that that creates additional complexities for us to ensure we're meeting our duty of care to young people who we would agree that they were under 18 but until there's a formal age assessment and further agreement have to access adult services. Yeah, in many places we don't have registered birth certificates and yeah, so on, exactly. so there's not yeah. documentation. Uh, yes, Nicola. I'd just like to reiterate that we support um, the presumption of age um, clause added to the bill um, and also the definition of a child. Um, we are concerned that there would be some discrepancies or ambiguities around support provision for 16 and 17 year olds. Um, and that would be something, for, for any reason, we wouldn't any, want any gaps in service provision. So, yes, we would reiterate and echo what's been said. Alison, do you want to come back in? Um, Christian. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to challenge a little bit the round table on, on, a, on, on three points. Uh, we heard a lot this morning about uh, being more explicit and trying to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to be more detailed regarding th th this bill. And particularly, I, I read on the submission that people talk about this bill being uh, gender blind, for example. Uh, and uh, there, were, there were an issue about nationality, of course, uh, people being trafficked from, from abroad. Now, I wonder if uh, it'll be helpful to know your views on what, how specific the bill should be. Because if we are too specific, knowing, uh, and, and we visited uh, uh, Tara uh, last week, knowing how the child traffickers, uh, particularly, and, uh, uh, and, and traffickers of adults as well, are very clever at finding loopholes, uh, would it be helpful maybe not to be so specific, and uh, especially on the sentencing part, and making sure that uh, two genders can be, uh, genders, for example, in prost uh, on prostitution, we've got to make sure that uh, uh, male are protected as well. On age, we've got to make sure as well that there is statutory defence uh, for adults as well, if, 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 if it's your will. And on nationality, we've got the big, big problem of, uh, yes, we can protect, but how much can we protect EU citizens or even UK uh, nationals who've, 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 who've been trafficked at one point or another? So if you could address that point. So it really, helpful. under that umbrella, of if we're too specific, we could get it wrong by excluding people. Bronna. Please, Bronna Andrew. Just to pick up on the point around gender services, um, what we know globally and across Europe is it's predominantly women and children who are exploited for all forms of, um, of human trafficking. Uh, we have obligations under the Council of Europe Convention and the EU Directive. They recognise the gendered nature of this crime um, and recognise that gender-specific services should be provided. I think using that language of gender specific doesn't preclude men and boys from accessing supports that are pertinent to their particular needs but I do think that in particular for women who have survived quite extreme sexual violence gender serve gendered services are an absolute requirement yeah um sorry where I've got, got a bit where am I going now point point in the right direction Graham O'Neill there you are. Which way? <laughs> right. Sorry, Graham. <laughs> well, it's really just to echo what, what Bruna had said um, in response. Like, I think one of the, the real virtues of the legislation that's being proposed is its inclusivity and its bringing into being uh, in Scotland the, an inclusive definition of trafficking, which 
hones in on exploitation and then works back from that in terms of saying, right, well, who is the person that's been exploited and what are their characteristics? Uh, as Broner very rightly said, the international law has, has recognised that, that women, children, including particularly girls, are vulnerable, particularly vulnerable to, to being taken advantage of and being exploited. So the next level up from that inclusive definition is recognising that vulnerability in terms of key points around identification of indicators of trafficking, which may be there right through to, you know, the criminal justice system rightly take having particular a low opinion of individuals that exploit children, for example, uh, through issues like aggravating factors and sentences being applied in, in, in the relevant regional you know, European Union Human Trafficking Directive and Council Europe Convention, recognise that explicitly and rightly so. So I think it's, I can completely understand the rationale in terms of the question, in terms of wanting to you know, make sure that we don't have an unintended consequence of limiting protections, but I think the what matters is we have an inclusive definition of the crime and then we recognise the particular vulnerabilities for particular groups of people uh, through, as I say, trafficking indicators being honed into that. And that would be an interesting issue to look at in terms of trafficking indicators is does the bill deal adequately with trafficking indicators in terms of vulnerability for gender and age particularly? Um, and, uh, and then also through to how the criminal justice system deals, deals with it. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get this trafficking indicator thing in my head. Is that not dealt with under section one of the, de the definition? Yeah, you know, trafficking indicators is, is, is very much, you know, what are the kind of characteristics, uh, you know, age could be a part of being a child, it could be gender, it could be the control methods that have been applied to an individual, such as debt bondage or threats to one's family and loved ones. Um, it's, trafficking indicators, it's, I suppose it's more accurate, it's more of a policy term that's used. Yeah, that's not be more useful for the police and Lord Advocate rather than the face of a bill? It, it could. That, that's a legitimate debate to have about do we want to present traffic indicators in the face of the bill or do we want to have it in guidance? Certainly we want to have it in guidance, so you know it's a legitimate question. But the reason I was raising it as an example yeah. to, to answer your legitimate point, Christian, about you know um, the unintended consequence of being too specific in, in terms of the face of the legislation, and I don't think that's a problem so long as we have a very inclusive definition of the crime. On the being too specific, I have Nicola, Merrin, Lisa, Gamble, Chloe, Swift, Gord MacDonald. Now, if, you've, if you're agreeing, just so we can get through absolutely everything, because this is your one shot, just say, I support that view. That would be helpful. I know it, it's, it's curtailing a little bit, but there's other issues I think we want to pick at in this bill that we want to get absolutely right from the point of view of um, people who um, are abused and who have to use services whom you meet. Nicola Merrin, Lisa Gamble, Chloe Swift, Gordon MacDonald. Just to clarify, is this to make the, the vulnerabilities more, more vague? Yes, we would support that. Um, we would support Tara and the position, abuse of a position of vulnerability. We would support that. Thank you. Lisa Campbell. Um, specific in children. Currently, the bill doesn't recognise the vulnerability or needs of children at all in the face of the bill. So just want to make that clear. So we, we've got that bit. Chloe Swift. Yeah, it, it's the this, this same point really, just to, to clarify that, that obviously the, the vulnerabilities of children aren't addressed on the bill and their children have particular vulnerabilities as Graham identified. Thank you. Uh, Bronna, sorry, I missed you. And then right. I, I just wanted to kind of state that I think that's where the position of abuse of vulnerability comes into its, its, its own right. Um, the EU directive um, defines this as a position of vulnerability means a situation in which the person concerned has no real or acceptable alternative but to submit to the abuse involved. And I think that recognises that vulnerability is multifaceted, that there are a whole lot of different issues that impact to make an individual vulnerable to, to this mm -hmm. crime. Thank you. Gordon MacDonald. Yeah, it's just to draw attention to um, something that was in our written evidence, which is that the European Parliament last year passed a resolution in which they noted that 96% of identified and presumed victims are either women or underage girls, um, and 62% uh, of people are trafficked for reasons of sexual exploitation. So that does show the, the gender nature of the crime. Thank you. Margaret. 
to, to, I suppose, elaborate a little bit on the provision in Section 1, and particularly the, the use of the word travel, uh, to see if there were some concerns around that or any other of the aspects in Section 1? I know, I think we share your concern about the use of the word travel um, because it ties in with this immigration idea and so on from the evidence we had at Bernardo's. It was, it was. Can somebody assist us in that? Thank you, Rona Andrew. Um, I, I think for us, we were concerned at the use of the word travel. Travel implies international movement. Um, so we were, we were concerned that by, by focusing overtly on that one word, would that mean that British cases for children and adults of sexual exploitation, if they were moved from one part of a city to another, would that constitute travel? Part of our concern about um, that the offence as defined is that it doesn't reflect the means element um, and that the, word, that the word travel focuses very much on uh, that, that, that movement, if, if you like, which skews, I think, our understanding. Um, Jenny Mara, within, in, in her um, submission around a private, for the private members bill, had, 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 had recognised the call for a definition of human trafficking within Scots law. My understanding is the offence as it stands would act as the definition and as such it doesn't capture that important means element of the act of human trafficking. I'm rattling around looking for that EU directive. Can anybody help us out with that? Because there was a better definition there, I felt. It's in one of the submissions. I'll let you look for it and save me looking for it. And I'll take, in the meantime, Nicola Merrin. Um, yes, that's in, in relation to... Um, well. Yes, the means element. I've, I've got listed here that although the means element is within part of the bill on exploitation, um, I think it's section eight of the, subsection 8 of the exploitation part, um, it isn't within the full definition. And also there's no element of giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person. Um, my understanding is that that's just not there at all. Um, so we would reiterate um, Tara's point on the definition. It's the bit about travel I'm looking for. Jane, Sat Jane Baxter mm -hmm. handed me the directives, but it's the one which deals with your point, which takes that emphasis away from travel. It's still important, but it is not the be-all and end-all. That's, I think, our concern. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, and again, it's about that definition of travel. Arguably, you could be um, a woman who is exploited, meets all the tests, who is in Glasgow and has moved from Pollock Shaws to Postle Park. Would the offence as it stands capture that? Would she meet that test for, for travel. Also, potentially, what, what we know about trafficking is it can be in se it's a process, several stages, and my concern is that some perpetrators might not be caught by the, the offence. So somebody is responsible for recruitment, someone is responsible for transportation. Once in the country of origin, somebody else is responsible for the means element, the coercion, the abuse. The individual's then sold on to somebody who's exploiting, and it's whether the offence will capture all of those perpetrators involved in that journey of, of somebody being trafficked and exploited. What about travel in that section? Because you look at, sec at one subsection B, arranges or facilitates that travel with a view, and then again in section 1-2, is irrelevant whether the other person consents any part of the arrangement or facilitation of the travel. And there's huge emphasis on that. that we understand that's important, but I think there may be another way of perhaps you can help us of doing it. You had mentioned the irrelevance of consent, and I think that, that a point has been made by others that it's only in specific, um, relating to the travel element, whereas I think it should relate to all um, elements of the definition, the means and the exploitation as well. I'll get, we'll get the directive quoted at us at some point as you rummage around there for it. Uh, Lisa Gamble, please. I'll pick up on Brona's point about the importance to make sure that this bill adequately covers internal trafficking. Um, Bernardus one of our key areas is child sexual exploitation and we run services for child sexual exploitation in Scotland and you came to visit Safer Choices. Within that service in the last year, we've had two cases that we've dealt with that have been international trafficking from out with the UK where children had come via the northeast of England. But 10 of those cases actually had been internal trafficking, so children being trafficked throughout Scotland, whether it's from Glasgow to Aberdeen or to Fife, and it's really important, I think, that we are mindful of that as the bill proceeds. 
I, I, yes, I think the word travel is kind of limiting us here. I've now got Elaine, Jenny, John Finney and Roderick. Elaine. Um, several of the written submissions refer to the need to um, decriminalise the sale of sex and to criminalise the purchase of sex and the suggestion that that could be part of this bill. I was wondering whether that is better dealt out with this bill as a separate piece of legislation, as Rhoda Grant originally suggested, or whether it would be covered under, in the long title under provision to reduce activity related to related offences. Yes, Gordon MacDonald. Well, it is included in the Northern Irish Human Trafficking Bill, so I'm sure it could be covered in this bill if there was the political will to do so. I think that the issue is whether the political will is there to consider it as part of this bill. Um, we would certainly encourage the committee to consider um, uh, uh, supporting an, uh, an amendment at stage two um, in relation to that area. Um, clearly, if there was a feeling that there was more information was needed, then, then it could be looked at um, as a separate piece of legislation. But, but certainly it's been around the houses a little bit, that, that issue. We've had a, a proposal for a bill before, um, and uh, there's no reason why it can't be included in this legislation. It wouldn't mean it's stage two, however, that if it did proceed with an amendment, it would have to be, I think, substantial evidence because it would be expanding the scope, would it not, to, to catch all purchase of sex, taking it beyond a human trafficking bill to beyond it. Would you agree or not that we'd require to take further evidence? It, it, would, it would cover all purchase of sex, yes. Um, but the, the, the reason for doing it, um, I think, would be primarily to deal with the problem of human trafficking. Yes, but I'm, I'm perfectly suitable, but I'm just saying it would require, because it would be all-encompassing, we'd have to, I suspect, but it might be the case, there'd have to be substantial evidence taken on it. I'm not saying ruling it out, I'm just making a point uh, that might be the case. Would you concur? Um, yes, um, the committee could, of course, consider appointing a rapporteur to go away and, and look at the issue and ah. come back with, well, with some information. Or well, leave the committee to about that. I, think, I think we might not want to do that um, on such a substantial matter. But I've got Lisa. Is this the def? Who's got the definition I've been looking for? Excellent. Um, the focus is more on control. So it's taken from Article 2 of the EU Trafficking Directive, which provides the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harbouring, or reception of persons, including the exchange or transfer of control over those persons by means of the threats or use of force or other forms of coercion, abduction and fraud. I like that definition better myself if I could have found it whenever I saw it last night. Um, but I, I think the control the element control, would yes. take in your domestic uh, trafficking as well across uh, parts of the UK. Um, I've got now Bronna. What do you want to come in, Bronna, Andrew? I was just coming in uh, and under kind of the point that, that Gordon raised. Um, the Council of Europe uh, Convention and the EU Directive um, provide for member states to take actions against the prevention of human trafficking. If we're applying a supply and demand model, I think the links between the sex industry and women being trafficked to meet the demands um, are, are clear. But within um, articles under both the, the directive and the convention. Member states can take, uh, can consider the criminalisation of the use of a victim of trafficking. I think it is something that, that we need to, to consider. Supply and demand, I'm just looking at the point of view of uh, evidence required from it. Yeah, Elaine? Just ask if anybody, you made reference to the Northern Ireland human trafficking bill. Was that actually in the first draft of the bill? Did that, was that yes, there from the beginning? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, there was obviously some debate in Northern Ireland, but um, uh, when it came down to it, um, the vast bulk of the parties supported it uh, in Northern Ireland, including Sinn Féin. Thank you for that. I'm going to move now to Jenny. Jenny, followed by John Finney, followed by Roderick. Jenny Manor. Convener, I have three... Patterson, a long time ago you joined us and I forgot to mention it. So there you are. <laughs> long time. Jenny, sorry. Convener, I have three specific questions, if you'll allow me. Um, the first is on, um, to go back to the definition of a child, I wanted to ask um, a legal question on that. We have, um, we've been told this morning that we don't have the, the presumption. Can any of the witnesses tell me that if the bill was to proceed without that presumption, are we in breach in any way of Council of, of Europe or the EU directive recommendations? Just put your three questions and then we can let them discuss what's the other two. 
Okay, the second question is the same question, but on the uh, non-prosecution element of the bill. Um, if we are to proceed, as the bill states, uh, just with the uh, Lord Advocate's guidelines, are we then falling short of the EU directive uh, on this or Council of Europe recommendations for the protection of uh, victims, the non-prosecution element? And my third question, convener, is on the definition. Do witnesses round the table think that uh, we would be better with um, a rewritten definition of the crime of trafficking that is more robust and all-encompassing and that therefore would include the means as well? Fine. I think some have been sort of glanced and glancingly touched at, but happy to. You can address all three if you wish or not, as the case may be. Who wants to come? Sorry? Looking, I know they've been touched on, but I'm just looking no, for no, full no, sort of legal back. clarification on We're that. going back to them, Jenny, um, and it's Chloe Swift. I'm not sure I can give you the, the legal counsel, but certainly um, Article 13 um, of the EU Directive does state really clearly that um, member states should ensure that where, a person, where, where the age of a person subject to trafficking in human beings is uncertain and there are reasons to believe that a person is a child, that person is presumed to be a child in order to receive immediate access to assistance, support and protection. Um, and similarly, Article 8 talks about non-prosecution um, or non-application of penalties to the victim. And I know that obviously the, the EU directive is um, legally binding, so um, it would be down to the lawyers, I think, to interpret exactly what that means. But from our perspective, um, certainly the, the presumption of age should be included in the, in the bill. Right. Anyone else want to come in on that? Yes. Uh, Graham, please. Graham O'Neill. To echo uh, what Chloe was saying in relation to the presumption of age, particularly in relation to the EU Human Trafficking Directive as a directive, it's got direct effect. Uh, I think it's a, it's it's. I actually don't know if it's a tenable omission to have within the, within the legislation, uh, given that it, you know that it is a clear requirement within the EU Human Trafficking Directive as well as the Council of Europe Convention. So I think that it's something. That, uh, that, that I would hope and expect, and I'm sure many others would hope and expect, would be would be resolved within the legislation. Just to, Can I just clarify that, Grim, are you saying that the um, lack of presumption here that the bill falls short of the EU directive? If it's the case that there isn't any other statutory provision within Scotland for that, then I think that there's certainly uh, that, that is certainly a legitimate question. I can't. I'm stopping short of absolutely clarifying that. But what I'm saying is, is that if there is no other statutory provision for survivors of trafficking, that is children under 18, uh, for presumption of age, then, then yes, then. And the same question really applied to um, prosecution, statutory defence. If it's not there, is this a breach of a EU directive? Who wants to have a bash? Brona. It's a breach of the directive because the language is quite careful in that member state states can consider or should be entitled to consider. So I don't know that it is a, it's a breach of the, 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 the European our obligations, um, but it is a bit, I think it is something that you know, we need to, I think we need to legislate for. I don't to preempt the committee, but I suspect that in terms of a statutory defence, the committee would be quite sympathetic round the table to it and bearing in mind the faculty and law society will also come out in favour so I think that's something we're already pushing an open door for us um, Yes, Nicola Merrin I would just like to say I think the, the um, international law does say um, as, as Brown had said there's something to do with allow or they should put in place provisions for you know, that this can happen and yes the Lord Advocate guidance would do that but um, our position is that is already in place there is stronger provisions than the other legislation, um, and we would like to see that. We would like to see both. Yeah. And back to also the definition we've written, which we've glanced at a little, Gordon MacDonald. Uh, just one other point about the definition. The, um, the definition in the bill doesn't include um, forced begging or criminal activities, which are included in the EU directive. Um, is there, a um, there may well be a catch-all, but it talks about provision of services and acquisition of benefits, but not force begging and criminal activities, which is specifically mentioned in the EU directive. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's a catch-all so that there's not a way around it. There usually is, and other connected activities or something. Is there anywhere in the... Yeah, no, please. Section 3, subsection 7, um, as Gordon just said about the 
per the person is subjected to four states of deception designed to induce the person to provide services and um, provide someone else with benefits. So I think that would cover maybe, can, but I think point that is, might be useful to the we, like we would like to have it specified uh -huh. begging, force marriage um, and criminal activity. Uh, Chloe Swift. Thanks. Uh, on the definition, I just wanted to be really clear that um, if we're, we're looking at Article 2, then um, the, there's a particular um, clarification around children um, where the means um, sh are, which are referred to in the second limb of the directive's definition um, reflect children's particular vulnerabilities and the fact that where a child is a victim of trafficking, um, no possible consent to exploitation should be ever considered legally valid. So just a, a point of clarification on that if, uh, if we're moving away from the emphasis on travel. Okay. Um, do you want to come back in, Jenny? Do you want to know? Um, now I've got John Finney. Please, John. Convener, um, we've heard um, panel about the, almost the hierarchy of interests that there are, the immigration authorities, the criminal justice authorities, and certainly the approach I favour is the one that Chloe articulated, a rights-based approach for the individuals. I wonder in relation to that, um, it's specifically for Graham and Christopher, I have a question, it's about the Scottish Refugee Council submission there, where you talk about <clears throat> some of the powers that may come with the Smith Commission significantly the, the right to grant trafficking survivors temporary leave to remain for specific purposes. Can you comment whether, please, uh, the bill as proposed would make, uh, remove some of these tensions between the different layers of interest there are, uh, and whether uh, the extent to which the additional powers for Scottish ministers would help? I think everyone acknowledges it is an international issue that requires cooperation. But th that specific proposal, if you could, please. That, who's picking that one up? Uh, yes, yeah, thanks, John. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, one, one of the, the, the frustrations we've had is the conflation of immigration with trafficking. And um, we welcome, as I was saying at the outset, that Scotland's taking responsibility in legislation for survivor assistance and care. We think that a precondition for that is survivor identification also. And we also think that a logical conclusion of that, taking more realistic approach in Scotland for what happens to survivor, is what get, the powers being available to Scottish ministers precisely because they are taking the responsibility and identification and assistance and support also to be available to enable the fullest possible recovery of the survivors because they and Scottish institutions and Scottish first sector organisations are the ones that are closest to the survivor, know what the survivor needs, knows to have the trust and the confidence. And it would be a real shame and it would be quite perverse if after this bill gets implemented, that you have the Home Office coming in and removing somebody from the country. Uh, and that's what we want to avoid, because that's not a survivor-centred approach. And what that does is immigration in practice, concretely in the lives of an individual, intrudes upon an individual being able to survive. And we don't think that would be in the interest of anybody, including uh, UK authorities either. So what is a logical conclusion of taking a fully survivor sensitive approach to this crime and this human rights violation that, as we've said in the Smith Commission proposal and, and to the parties, very much to their credit, they agreed that the UK and Scottish governments should give additional consideration to this question should trafficking survive, should Scottish ministers have, uh, through a process of executive devolution, the power as opposed to a policy arrangement, but the actual power to grant temporary leave to remain for specified purposes for trafficking survivors. That is compliant with international um, obligations around enabling the fullest possible recovery of those individuals, as well as, if applicable in certain cases, to enable them to, to be witnesses, for example, in criminal proceedings. So we, as you would hope and expect, are taking a close interest in working with Scottish and UK governments um, to, to, to encourage that process and we think that given that we have the human trafficking exploitation bill going through the Scottish Parliament now, as we said in our submission, we would really invite the, the committee to, to take an interest in that uh, and we would be very happy to work with, with you on, on that, uh, on developing uh, that further. Yes, thank you. Wait a minute, I've got somebody before you. I have Nicola Merrin, um, Baron Andrew and then I've got you. <laughs> So there's a list. Is it commenting on this? Was, it was in response to that, I imagine, Christopher's wishing to yes, use my thing. Oh, sorry, yeah. did you name Christopher Gill? I'm sorry, I missed that. Right. Um, yeah, no, uh, I agree with um, Graham and Scottish Refugee Council. And I think the impact on, on 
ongoing investigations for the police is severely hampered when home office involvement um, will remove someone from the country, um, which it ties in with um, you know our comments on the fact that there needs to be if if the survivor chooses to go home, and there are some instances where they are just desperate to go home as quickly as possible, it needs to be of their own volition, and it needs to be because they uh, well, they wish to do so, and that there needs to be a support and a framework there for ongoing support, regardless of whether they're in this country or not. Um, and then that will also uh, act as a bridge for the police investigations should they wish to still remain in contact with with someone who's returned home as well. And the, the lack of framework um, in general for this is is quite startling. We've uh, we've counted at least ten different mechanisms for someone to return home via different projects or programs, or and things like that. And that's that's not helpful. It's not helpful to them, and it's not helpful to us, and it's not helpful to Police Scotland. Thank you. Is the problem then? I'm asking this national referral mechanism. Is that the problem? You know, it, I think it's under some kind of review, but it's a UK wide, and, and you know that. Could we do with something that draws together everything in Scotland? Um, so, so not being uh, in some kind of silo, obviously sharing, because yeah. people move about um, and, and so on. But is that part of the problem? That the National Referral Mechanism, Jeremy Oppenheim um, produced his report recently where he uh, has proposed that there was more of a, um, a panel than it just laying with either the UK HTC or UK Visas and Immigration, um, and that that panel will be... Um, the the focus of it, as, as Graham said, it is, is very different um, because they're looking at a victim-centred approach, not necessarily an immigration violation. Um, and there's uh, recently the Human Trafficking Foundation, I think it was actually Bernardo's in, in England, and, um, and ECPAP produced some um, worrying um, correspondence from UK VNI rejecting somebody's application to become a victim of human trafficking. Um, and it's it's the, the culture that they operate within that will dictate and, and it's the lens that they see through as to whether somebody is, is, has had their human rights violated and it is a victim. But, and it's, but it's also, as I read it, to ensure they receive the appropriate protection and support. Now, a lot of that support will be very local from councils and so on if it's in Scotland. And, that, yeah. and I was, we were hearing from yourself that different interpretations that are made of what's provided so would that not be more helpful given that the services and if you're looking for support to be very early on before one even gets into any criminal system or whatever or speaking to police that, that, that there's something here that's better and, and coordinated and so far as possible universal in Scotland yes I agree how would you do it? I mean, how would you do it? This is what I'm asking about this national referral mechanism that you've raised. You know, that it doesn't seem, it seems lumpy. It's a word of mine. But you know what I mean by it? It doesn't, yes. Nicola Merrin, you tell me. Oh, dear. Um, <coughs> I think... The, no, I will. I will. Don't worry. Um, I think the issue, and it has been raised time and time again in various reports, um, there, there are some issues with the national referral mechanism. Um, and obviously that's a deserved issue is a UK issue, and, and they are reviewing that in the moment. What we can do within the bill and the strategy is to ensure um, that support is provided before and separate to the NRM process. We know You're that... It to some no, no, I think... It, it's tied in. I think that the, the issue just now for us is that the funding... If, if you're a victim of trafficking, you're a suspected victim of trafficking. Um, and until we decide that you are a victim of trafficking, we, I think there's flexibility. I mean, Tara will, will explain that um, at the moment. But what we're looking for is more than flexibility. What we're looking for is the provision of support before that person decides that they may wish. To what I'm getting at is where you have, you have a, as reasonably as possible a comprehensive note of people who are both identified or suspected of being victims of trafficking mm. and support in place and therefore ensuring that all this talk about strategies and so on, actually in practical terms, they get the same support throughout Scotland and you know who they are and where they are. And I don't know if that's happening with just now, that's what I'm asking. And I'm looking at you, oh, Bronna Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, the national referral mechanism 
as it stands and as it's been reviewed and the recommendations to take it forward, I think that would be an evidence session in its own right, to be honest with you. For a long time, Tara have been um, very supportive of a Scottish national referral mechanism. I think we gave evidence to the Equal Opportunities Committee back in 2010, and we're saying that actually the system as it stands at the moment, and bear in mind there have been recommendations for significant change, um, was too focused on immigration, was too focused on credibility, was too, wasn't, didn't take a, a victim-centred approach as such, um, and was an interpretation of what the Office for Security and Cooperation in Europe have suggested a national referral mechanism would be. It should be about identification and about protection, but the system has become around testing credibility, it's become around data collection, it's become around a lot of things apart from that individual who is potentially trafficked and building a wall of support and protection around them so that they feel safe and they then feel able to support investigations and prosecutions. Um, I can I can provide you with further information well, about the National... It's a Security reference to the Equal Opportunities, and we'll get Spice to provide us with material on that. Lisa Gamble to be followed by um, Graham O'Neill. But Lisa Gamble... Um, just with regards to children yeah, and provisions of support, if you're under 18, um, your provisions for, for support should be provided within the child protection system, and the child should get access to full assessment um, in line with the principles of GERFIC. Um, for future support. Um, our concerns about the NRM is that those decisions are probably best made by a person that knows the child, but where maybe not enough information goes into an NRM form, then people are making decisions not based on the full information about the child, and that will have quite a big impact on the outcomes for the child. And I think maybe that's something that Katrina could pick up on in the NRM and children. I'll, I'll take, first of all, if you want to come in first, Graham O'Neill, do you want to defer? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I would agree. That, I mean, the NRM doesn't really offer children that much, to be honest with you, and they don't consent to enter that process. Um, you know, you quite often will have you know, multi-agency meetings that's of professionals that know the child and are much more experienced in doing assessments, saying that we think there's enough indicators to suggest this child's been trafficked. Yet it can go to, well, for our group of children, it goes to the um, UK VI to, to, to make that decision. Um, and sometimes it comes back saying, we don't think the child's been trafficked. And it actually has a detrimental effect because sometimes then local authorities then remove the kind of safeguard measures that's in place for that child because somebody the Home Office has said they've not been trafficked. Um, when, you know, you've got many professionals saying that they think the child has been trafficked. So it really is just... The NRM for a child is more about data collection, really. <coughs> um, it doesn't really offer much. I don't think I've had any of the young people I work with that's actually received any kind of um, leave from being identified as a victim of trafficking. You know, it really doesn't, you know, I think the, the, the decision could be better made within child protection um, teams. And, and Thank I think you. It's just I'll, a, I'll take Graham O'Neill now. The NRM was set up reactively to, by the UK government in response to its obligations under the Council of Europe Convention. Um, it wasn't set up with the, the needs of the individuals who were going through that in mind, uh, you know, as a primary interest. Uh, now, I realise that's quite a shitting to say, but I think numerous reports have found that it doesn't deliver for particularly children. I mean, there's nothing for children in relation to the national referral mechanism, and, uh, and as, well as, as, as well as for adults well, as well. And uh, Jeremy Oppenheimer's review for the Home Secretary, it was published last November, made some very good points. There was other bits that I think that, that could be worked through, but there were some very good points made within it. Some of the good points were that, you know, the principle of the people who are closest to the individual, uh, and in Scotland's case, that will be your professionals and statutory bodies, including uh, Tara and others, should be the ones, you know, a multi-agency approach based on a, a child protection assessment principles applied also to adults, you know, so you have a shared decision about what's best for that individual and that individual's involved in that, as opposed to a form getting filled out, getting put down, 
to, to, the, to the UK Human Trafficking Centre, the Home Office, and then people don't really hear about it. It's, it's, it, it's, it has no discernible impact on an individual's life, apart from the most serious one, which is the decision about whether somebody's to be accepted. So it's, it's a system that's been set up in practice, not with the needs of the individual uh, at the start. And that's why this bill has got a real opportunity to, to, to think about, well, how can we design a system, which of course one wants it to be consistent with the uh, UK because of the international crime dimension, but nonetheless, one should never compromise that in relation to making sure that we have multi-agency assessment-based decision-making of those who know, that, who know that person, the survivor best, being able to put in, 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 put in place the assistance package that will enable that person to recover as much as possible from it. So there's a real opportunity, I think, in this bill. Understandably, the government didn't put that in the, the draft they introduced because the timings were coinciding with the publication of Jeremy Oppenheimer's review, but that's now been published. The Home Secretary has accepted the recommendations in principle. And I know that discussions are going on between the UK and Scottish Government officials and ministers about you know, how identification question can be answered through the, this legislation and other legislation. I think the committee would want to take an interest in that, particularly when it speaks with the minister. We are. Chloe Swift, then um, Bronna Andrew, and then Christopher Gall. Um, I think some of the complexities... Yes, yes, Ron, Ron, oh, sorry. I'll let you in immediately after Christopher Gall, no matter who puts their finger in the air, and that's Gil Patterson. So there you are. Right. Yes, please, um, yes. <laughs> I have to keep them happy. I have to keep them happy. Of yes. Um, I think some of the complexities that have just been described around the table are one of the best arguments for um, needing to put the, the guardianship service on a statutory footing um, to help children navigate through some of those, those um, challenges and complexities of the NRM processes um, and through some of the, the complex child protection procedures and some, in some cases the asylum and immigration um, issues as well. Um, one of the things that we've called for is ensuring that there's an independent guardian on the face of the bill um, that can protect children's rights, advocate for their best interests and get them the help they need to realise those rights. Um, and in addition to that, I know Katrina might want to, to pick up on some of those points. We've also called... Oh, sorry. Roddy has, to get, <laughs> Roddy has to get in before he bursts. Well, right. she, I know. She, <laughs> she agrees with me. <laughs> Um, I think uh, the other thing is around a clause um, that, that really highlights the, the need for public bodies to take into account the best interests of the trafficked child and the separated child, um, which is uh, something that we've, we've been calling for um, in terms of, of ensuring that um, some of the issues around trafficking, the particular vulnerabilities of children are, are protected and that um, the existing child protection system and, and the existing legislation is brought into line under this uh, best interest duty. Thank you very much. Brona. Mm -hmm. Brona Andrew. I think I just wanted to pick up that there were similar issues around uh, the NRM for adults that, that children are experiencing as um, a very experienced first responder. We still are told that, that individuals who we have assessed have been trafficked are not trafficked for the purposes of the, the NRM, which is, is, is challenging and impacts on those women and impacts on their ability to recover, but also to continue to engage. Um, there's sometimes, I think, a, too much of a focus on decisions coming from the national referral mechanism. Um, and it is, a, it, it is, in effect, it's a policy, it's a process, it is not a legal status. As it, as it stands um, at, at the moment. So I think, I think just echoing kind of colleagues, it's a very complex process. Um, I know that, that Margaret Mitchell and Christian met a couple of women that we support and when asked about the national referral mechanism, don't really understand what you're talking about, particularly from those who also have an ongoing asylum claim. It's just the Home Office. It's just another thing they've had to sign. And we sometimes query about the informed consent and the capacity to consent that adults provide to enter into the NRM um, and, and how that impacts on, on what they understand about their rights and their information and the impact that that also has on, on further immigration uh, claims. Christopher Wall. Yes, it, I again totally agree with Tara. Um, I think just the issue of a Scottish NRM or um, 
it would impact into other things that we've we've put in our submission, um, such as the fact that the current NRM doesn't record pre-trafficking experience or social economic context of the individual prior to being trafficked. It's information that's vital if we're looking to to stop it, um, and you know, this could be a leading. Uh, you know, you want this to be a progressive and leading bill, and, and Scotland could really take the lead, I think, on this issue. Um, and again, this would this would impact more into police Scotland and data sharing. Um, and the f we would welcome um, data sharing mechanisms between people like ourselves and Tara who work with the victims for a, a substantial period of time who probably retain quite a pool of information that, that could be vital, but that would, again, need to be worked out um, to make sure that the victims are not, that they are the focus and not the information that comes from them. Roderick. Thank you, convener. I, I just wanted to come in because we were considering kind of alternatives to NRM to the question of uh, the provisions in the Bill 8.4 and 8.5, Duty to Secure Support and Assistance. Um, the Bill doesn't include provision for a survivor service as the Faculty of Advocates, of which I'm a member and I refer to my interest in that respect, makes reference in their submission. Um, I think Abolition Scotland also include uh, uh, reference to the fact that Section 8 might be strengthened by some legislative provision. Um, the faculty suggests um, that minimum standards for support and assistance, whether by way of primary legislation or by a statutory code of practice, uh, might improve matters. I wanted to really to have uh, the panel's views on, on the, that provision in the Act at the moment and to, to what extent uh, they would favour it being strengthened by such mechanisms. Yes. Mr. Neil. Well, um, for England and Wales has, has rightly recognised the need for clarification around what support means and assistance means, and uh, it's done that through the level of guidance. Um, and I think that you know absolutely, um, clause eight within the bill needs to, to, to provide either the level of statutory code of practice or the level of guidance, clarification and some key questions around what support and assistance actually means, what criteria is going to be applied uh, in relation to uh, access to, the, to that support and assistance. So that gets to the question about needs assessment and you know, how that's going to be worked through. Um, questions about, you know, as Brona was talking around, around informed consent, and we know that almost by definition, trafficking, the impact of trafficking is it traumatises individuals, and therefore, um, or the impact of exploitation traumatises individuals. And there's a whole question about you know, the timeline, about when somebody gets support, and you know, and this gets to the question about criteria, because you know, if it's a case that as, as a person's deciding whether or not they will want to consent or give informed consent, that they still need to, I would imagine in almost all cases support uh, before they can can do that. Uh, so you really, and this would be a, a thing that you would do if you're designing the needs of the new system around the survivor and actually the reality for a survivor. So I think that there does need to be real clarification underneath the bill in terms of statutory code of practice or guidance around how this duty is going to work. Uh, it's very good. It's very good that the, the Scottish government have. Have, have put this into primary legislation, the principle of giving uh, as, a, as a matter of duty, support and assistance to individuals. But we really need to clarify how it's going to work through in practice. Some of the points that Graham is making, we were really pleased to see those basic fundamentals of support included within um, the government bill that goes further than the modern slavery bill at Westminster. We do think it should be underpinned by statutory guidance, minimum standards for that support. We also think that all of those uh, supporting or investigating cases of human trafficking should have to undergo accredited training. I don't know if that's for the bill or if that's better placed within the, the strategy. I do think, though, that there needs to be some governance around the support provided to, to children and adults who, who have been trafficked. I also just want to flag up an issue about the support provision within the bill. The duty to support, uh, duty to secure support and assistance is very much for uh, victims of human trafficking. It doesn't cover those who have been uh, in, in held in slavery, servitude, forced to compulsory labour. I don't know if that's an oversight, but people who have been identified as trafficked can access that support, but those who have been identified as being held in slavery or servitude, it's not clear whether they would also be entitled to access that. I think that comes under uh, exploitation for purposes of offensive human trafficking. I may be wrong. 
I, 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 not being a lawyer, I'm and not four, sure how they all work together. Which also deals with it. I mean, it spreads the net pretty wide about what constitutes... But in Section 8, it talks about human trafficking. It doesn't talk about other forms of exploitation. Uh, I, I'll have to think about that. I think Section just, 4 probably just, secures that. I'm not, 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 I'll have a look. Nicola Merrin, please. Um, just following on from section. that point, um, we agree... Um, Again, Section 8.1, .1, if the adult is a victim of an offence of human trafficking. Um, we believe that instead of focusing on time periods, I know that's linked in with the NRM, um, also that there should be support provided from the moment of identification as a possible victim of human trafficking. Um, there's too much of an emphasis on credibility. Um, uh, imagine if someone came to Victim Support Scotland and says they were a victim of rape or, or anything, a victim of theft. We would never say to them, well, can you prove it before we provide you with a service? There's also an issue there with, um, especially with victims of human trafficking, that they are so vulnerable. Um, they need time to recognise what's happened to them to accept what's happened to them, um, which can often only be done through work with support workers, etc., um, and, and to move on, time for recovery before... They have no idea. They exactly. Think friends exactly. And so even before you. they get to the stage where they choose... And again, if you, if you compare that to um, mainstream or other victims, um, we provide information on the criminal justice system for them to make an informed decision as to whether they want to report to the police. And I think it's unfair for victims of human trafficking to be dealt with at a different level mm -hmm. um, and almost to be forced to go through that process. So, yeah, just to make sure um, that there's also an individual needs assessment coming back to what does the victim need, not to what do we consider that we might provide them. Um, and lastly, within Section 8.4 on the support and assistance, I'm not sure, I think it might be in the psychological services of NHS that brought up e-counselling. Um, just a, quite pedantic, but counselling is a specific um, psychological treatment, and I think that should be widened to psychological treatment, um, emotional support, something like that. It does say, but is not limited to the following. So it does say that at but the beginning of the clause. That, that was a very aggressive wave. I, I can see you. <laughs> Raise that, I'll go back to the office. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a consultant clinical psychologist co-located with our team um, three days a week, and they have provided their own submission, but we would recommend that there is a specific inclusion around access to psychological assessment and treatment if required. Many survivors of human trafficking have, um, have post-traumatic stress disorder, other mental health issues, and I know that... that um, Sharon Doherty, who's our, our psychologist, has uh, provided evidence within her submission that counselling is not always an effective treatment and can be harmful. <laughs> for 84C, um, medical advice and treatment, including... Including. I, yeah. I think a specific yeah. reference would be helpful. Gordon MacDonald. Yeah. I mean, we would echo the points that were made about counselling and uh, consistent standards across the country. Um, one other area which... Um, could perhaps do with a wee bit more clarity is in relation to accommodation, particularly the need for it to be appropriate and secure accommodation. Uh, and certainly I had a conversation recently with um, somebody um, in the police who said that there is a shortage of appropriate and secure accommodation for young people and children in particular in Scotland. OK. Yes, Roderick. Moving on from that, just... In terms of those provisions, I wondered what the panel's view were in terms of you know, kind of the overlap between those sections and what should be in um, the trafficking strategy and what general views people had as to what should be in the strategy. Yes, um, Lisa Campbell. I don't mean to be contrary, but uh, Bernard of Scotland would really like to see provision for children outlined within the bill and not in the strategy. Yes, the point's been made and taken. Um, Yes, Chloe Swift. Um, 
I think that, that we've been really clear about what we like to see around children on the face of the bill. In terms of the strategy, um, we like to see a rights-based approach, both for children and for adults. Um, and we like to ensure that um, there's some cohesion between the existing processes and ensuring that the particular vulnerabilities of children are taken into account through the existing child protection procedures on the face of the, the strategy um, through a rights-based approach that looks at the, the relevant articles of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, I've got Nicola, yes. Don't, don't worry about it. We're not counting. <laughs> um, do I win? No. In the strategy, we would, there would be two elements for us in particular. would be awareness raising um, of the public and of professionals. And I think a lot of good work's already happened on that, um, for example, through Police Scotland. Um, we believe that would help with the identification of victims. Um, and, and also, most importantly, how people deal with the situation where they come across someone who has been victimed. Um, who has been sorry, who has been victimised and trafficked. Um, part of the, the training element for professionals too um, would like to focus on, on lawyers and solicitors who may be um, in a, a position to identify people who have been trafficked um, if they're going through the prosecution system. Um, that's really important. Um, most fundamentally would be support and making sure that all agencies are working together. Um, there's been talk of, for example, compensation for victims of crime, um, which is quite often forgotten about. It's not as important as the provision of support. Um, but, for example, I think the Legal Services Agency would provide that help, but so do Victim Support um, Scotland. So, along with the specialist agencies, I think it's really important that everyone works together um, and a strategy would be the best place to, to lay that out. Dr Cairns. I'd say that um, the Sir Optimus for the last uh, eight years or so have been raising awareness of human trafficking. We, we do it throughout our communities and with uh, various clubs throughout Scotland and we have open meetings, encourage um, the public to come and hear about modern day slavery. And if I can just wear my old hat as a retired GP, um, um, we often got um, um, foreign nationals coming into the surgery with a translator and you're always that little bit suspicious because you can't have a one-to-one -one conversation uh, with the patient and I was talking to one of my younger colleagues who still practices and she's learnt a lot about modern day slavery from myself and from other Optimus and she's now really switched on to this whole thing about young women being brought in with uh, translators and not really being able to communicate and is, and is suspicious so it's not just about police social workers your healthcare workers need to know about trafficking and how to handle it thank you Christopher Gall I uh, totally agree with um, Nicola on the training of frontline professionals as well, and especially across local authority. Um, all frontline um, professionals, including the health services especially, as you, uh, for the, the points you rightly raised, um, uh, the fire services, your environmental health, so going into various buildings and businesses. These are the people who are, are going to see people, and these are the ones who need to learn to look laterally, not just at the jobs that they're doing. And so we totally agree that the training should be a heavily focus part of the strategy. Uh, Brona, please, Brona Andrew. Uh, we would like to see some of the prevention work really reflected within the strategy and not just prevention at a local or a national level, but also some of our international obligations to prevent trafficking, to prevent people being vulnerable to it in the first place, and also picking up on the points that Chris has made around safe returns to prevent re-victimisation uh, on, on return as, as well, so we would be keen to see a, quite a robust prevention uh, aspect to the strategy. Gordon yeah, I think there's an opportunity in the strategy to go into some of the, the more detail in relation to support for victims, particularly perhaps economic empowerment, basic literacy, etc. I would draw attention to the International Justice Mission um, uh, guidance, which we attach to our, our submission. And the other thing I think which could be looked at is um, how statutory agencies might work with civil society, um, particularly, possibly, even not just within the, within the boundaries of Scotland, but also victims who have um, gone back to their home country, how um, the Scottish Government might support them, perhaps um, even in that context, particularly um, through the, the overseas aid, and also looking potentially um, on that point at support for improving justice systems, um, because, um, as was quoted by um, Andrew Bevan, who's sitting in the, in the audience here, there are four billion 
people in the world who do not have access to proper justice systems. Um, and that's part of the problem, which is often neglected. Thanks. Um, Graham O'Neill. Mainly to, to, to echo and maybe develop Chloe's uh, really important point around the rights-based approach and, and uh, that part of the thinking with Jenny Mara's proposal was to the principle of involving survivors in the development of the strategic approach because the strategy is this long-term vehicle or this vehicle for long-term change in relation to this and, and it will be reporting to the parliament, the national parliament every three years. So I think that, that that needs to be something that is at the heart of, it may not be something that's in the face of the bill of course, but it certainly should be something that's one of the starting points for the development of the strategy because it's that principle of involving the people who are affected by it, but also there's really strong practical reasons to do it as well, given the insights uh, that unfortunately the individuals that have survived tra traffic to exploitation have. Yeah. Have you, Roderick? I'm hesitant about preventing you from saying, Gil. I apologise to everyone for being late. Uh, it's a very important matter that we're discussing, but I had a constituency uh, petition at the petitions committee it was a local hospice, so they needed my help. I don't know if I gave them any help right enough, but uh, that's where I was, so I'm sorry about that. Yeah, but well, particularly yes. to Tara, because they looked after us so well when we, we visited you in, in Glasgow. So apologies particularly to yourself. Okay. And my, my question, I hope it hasn't been taken before I arrived, was with regards to the UK Commissioner. It would seem that it's a reserved matter, and I wondered what people's or opinion were on that uh, in, in the context of the bill. No, oh, nobody has dealt with that. So that's the UK Commissioner. Yes, Graeme O'Neill. The, the UK Commissioner uh, is it's 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 very welcome that we ha we're going to have a UK Commissioner for for this for this for this human rights violation. Um, as as we at Scottish Refugee Council provided some submissions to the Justice Committee at the end of last year in the context of the legislative consent memorandum process in terms of the UK Commissioner. I think there's a, there is a, a serious question about whether the current provisions within the, the English and Welsh legislation uh, are adequate for safeguarding Scottish interests, <laughs> um, given that the vast majority of the competencies and the powers that relate to the well-being of survivors and, and also tackling this crime are devolved. Uh, and at the moment, there is reasonable consultative mechanisms in place for uh, the UK Commissioner and the Home Secretary, respectively, to, to be consulting Scottish ministers. But they are, at the end of the day, not from what I can see in the legislation, getting at the formulation of policy and the formulation of priorities. And it's at that point where you would want to have autonomy or some degree of discretion within a Scotland Commission part of the UK Commission, as opposed to at the end or nearer the end of the process when, when, uh, when you know, priorities have been nearly finalised. So we, we gave submissions at the end of last year on this point, and we definitely think it's something that needs to be at least considered by the committee going forward, as the question, particularly maybe when the Scottish ministers are, are, are giving evidence around, is the provisions in the English and Welsh legislation adequate for safeguarding Scottish interests? I don't want to, people to repeat things because we're running short of time now, but that's Bronna Andrews. So, yeah. I think we would like to see explicit mention of his obligations towards Scotland within the face of, of the bill um, to ensure that the, the, uh, the anti-slavery commissioner understands that we have a unique legal system. We have different uh, policies and processes that apply and that is reflected in that Scotland simply doesn't become a kind of an addition to his, his more general work. So we would be quite keen to see that made explicit on the face of the bill. Christina McKelvey, you were nodding, is that? It's certainly something I would support, uh, convener, and, and, and th thank you for, for allowing me to attend your committee today in a, a, a personal interest and political interest, but certainly uh, I, I would support that. We've had in front of the EU committee the EU's uh, trafficking commissioner, who was very, very clear about... Um, the responsibility of member states, but also the responsibility of regions within those member states, especially when they have different legal setups and, and devolved um, issues around about care, rehabilitation and support and health services. So um, certainly would, um, my nod was very affirmative. Yes, 
I thought it was an affirmative nod. Um, and now, Jane, can I, you've been patient, Jane Baxter. Yes, convener. Um, can I just say how fascinating it's been this morning to hear all the expert testimony about how we can make the bill better. Um, but I went on a visit to the Scottish Guardianship Service and um, was extremely impressed with what I saw and heard that day. And I just wonder um, what will happen for, for trafficked children if we don't develop and, and, and get into statute the sort of services that are provided there. I would like to ask Katrina, please, if she yes, could of course, speculate yes. about the consequences of not doing this, doing the things you do. Um, well, I think um, it's, it's been raised um, several times today about the, the particular vulnerabilities for children that's been trafficked. Um, I think having a guardianship service, a guardian working with that child, does help them to understand and participate in the processes they find themselves in. Um, I think guardians can hold people accountable just because a child's been looked after by a local authority doesn't mean that they're getting access to all their rights and entitlements and the appropriate safeguards are put in place. I think a guardian's looking out for the best interest of that child um, and making sure that they, all their needs are being met. Um. Guardian. It is, it yeah. is. So, you know, we will see um, children still arriving when they're 16 and getting put into their own tenancy, a trafficked child, which is clearly not suitable and it's not an appropriate safeguard, but there is lack of resources um, and because they're over 16, they'll not get put into a children's unit. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of actually providing um, the support and assistance that is appropriate for children. Um, but I think... Guardians, of, whilst we're advocates, will also play a huge part in educating and helping young people understand um, the processes because all the children we've worked with so far, bar one, I think, that's been trafficked is also claiming asylum. Um, and about 45% of the young people we work with undergo an age assessment and some have been through the criminal justice process as well. So you're talking about a child been through multiple processes and having to instruct um, lawyers. And, you know, I think a guardian is there to be by their side. Um, and it's it's a very complex process, but it's time intensive, the amount of hours and support that a guardian puts into working with that child is way above what any social worker would be able to provide. Um, and I do think that a lot of children would slip through the net if guardians weren't involved. Well, on that note, because I'm conscious that we've had quite a good uh, whack at this, and I thank you very much for your written evidence and your oral evidence, and say to that we'll probably see more evidence sessions, and um, we'll consider our draft one report after Easter recess when you can see the views we've come to. It's all very helpful, and thank you for the visits that you uh, gave to members as well. Very, very useful. I'll suspend for five minutes.
Thank you very much. I uh, now resume item three, Prisoners Control Lease Scotland Bill. Our first day of final day, I should first day, our final day of evidence taking at stage one of the Pris Prisoners Control Lease Scotland Bill. And we've got the Cabinet Secretary back to respond to issues raised in the letter of 3rd of February and in the evidence we heard last week in the round table. And I welcome Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and Neil Rennick, Acting Director of Justice, Scottish Government. And I know that we can go straight to questions from members, and I start with Roddy Campbell, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, you. Morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in the evidence sessions that we've had, and uh, again on the 24th of February, we had, I think, um, some misgivings as to uh, how this bill, where, what the evidence was that this bill would improve public safety and public protection. Uh, is there any additional evidence or uh, supporting facts that you can give the committee in relation to those concerns? Uh, as in ending the uh, automatic early release yeah. uh, that approach, well, there is evidence uh, that, um, that the committee might find uh, useful, and uh, Mr Campbell might find useful, I think it was in 2012-13, there were 476 uh, prisoners were subject to supervision in the community after parole release and there were 403 uh, were subject to supervision in the community after non-parole release. Those would be individuals who had uh, automatic early release. Um, the rate at which non-parole release prisoners breached their licence uh, conditions uh, was 37% compared to 5.5% for parole released prisoners. So that's in effect someone who has been released automatically is seven times more likely to breach their licence conditions than someone who's actually been released after a decision which has been made by the Pro Board. That's a significant uh, gap, which I think adds significant weight to the reasons why we should end automatic early release. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for, for those figures. Um, so, in your view, this bill would improve public protection. Is there anything further that you can say about uh, the use of extended sentences, which perhaps we didn't touch on in our most recent session? Well, I've got no doubt that um, ending automatic early release uh, for long-term prisoners uh, will help to improve uh, public uh, protection. Uh, there's, uh, there's already a, a significant number of uh, prisoners who receive a long-term sentence um, of four years or more who will receive an extended sentence, which is imposed by the court at that particular point uh, when the sentence has been handed down um, uh, based on the judgment that they believe that they require um, a, a, a period of uh, extended community supervision after they've been released from uh, prisons. Um, it, it, again, of course, it's entirely down to the courts to determine that, but there has obviously been an increase in the number of prisoners uh, who have received, uh, received extended sentences. Uh, and um, I, I suspect going forward that it would be a matter for uh, uh, judges uh, uh, and sheriffs to determine uh, to what extent they want to continue to use them and to what level. The, this bill, together with continued use of extended sentences, in your view, will improve public protection as to where it is at the present time? I believe it will, yes. Uh, and I think that was part of the reasons for the introduction of extended sentences previously. Uh, and that was to allow the courts to be able to impose an extended period of community supervision uh, post someone's release from prison uh, for them to be supervised and for any further measures to be taken forward once the person moved back into the community for the purposes of uh, protecting the public. Okay. Um, the second purpose of the bill is kind of rehabilitation of offenders. Is there anything further that you can add uh, on uh, programmes to assist rehabilitation in, in both in prison and indeed in, in the community at large? Well, I know you've already had evidence from Colin McConnell, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service, who's uh, undertaking a, a review of the way in which they deliver, they deliver the rehabilitation programmes and their courses within uh, the prison estate. There has been largely a, a tendency in the past that programmes have been delivered on block uh, and that uh, prisoners are just uh, slotted into the uh, programmes. And 
Um, I know that the Scottish Prison Service are keen to look at uh, developing programmes which are much more aligned to the assessment of the individual prisoners' needs in order to make sure that the programme is tailored uh, more, uh, reflecting more what that particular prisoner uh, may actually uh, require. That's a significant undertaking for uh, the Scottish Prison Service. Um, uh, but they want to move in that direction because they feel that would be a more appropriate way in which to deliver some of these uh, rehabilitation uh, programmes. So um, we are keen to support them uh, in moving in that direction. Um, uh, and um, I have no doubt that as we go forward, they will start to look at how they can take a much more, uh, uh, if you like, bespoke approach to how rehabilitation programmes are developed for prisoners uh, in order to improve uh, the delivery of them and also to improve the outcomes uh, that can be gained from these programmes. Okay, and finally, if I may, can, we heard a lot of evidence at the last evidence session about what was described as option A and option B, uh, kind of a lack of clarity, it was suggested in your letter um, to the committee about what the proposals that you were proposing to bring forward at stage two actually meant. Can you kind of... Option A and option B well, were? Um, I, I think the, the option A was can, some form of supervision at the end of um, an offender sentence. Option B was supervision with, w w still forming part of the, uh, ascendant, the offender sentence. And there seemed to be some co confusion on the part of the witnesses as to what your letter had actually meant. So over to you to clarify that. Well, it was clear from when I appeared at the committee um, the last time that um, you had some concerns around the issue of prisoners who uh, had not qualified uh, for early release, release through uh, parole, uh, that there was a potential for them to uh, be released at the end of their custodial sentence without any supervision in place. And at that point, I made clear to the committee that I'm open to exploring how that uh, could that particular concern could be uh, addressed. And having considered that, I think a period of guaranteed uh, supervision uh, would be the most appropriate way for that to uh, be taken forward. Um, that could be a period of guaranteed supervision, which is uh, a, a three or six month uh, period uh, uh, towards the end of the sentence. And I'm open to the views of the committee on that from the evidence which you've heard um, uh, as to how best uh, that time frame should be set. Um, but it was a reflection on the, the concerns and issues that had been highlighted by the committee from my my previous uh, uh, time before you, and uh, I, I believe that a, a period of uh, guaranteed supervision uh, would be an appropriate way to try and make sh to make sure that a prisoner, when they are being released, has got a period of supervision within the community. Thank you, Sir. Elaine. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, last week, the witnesses found it a bit difficult to comment, as, as Roddy Campbell's already suggested, uh, because they hadn't. Um, been able to see precisely what it was you were suggesting. Uh, I wondered if you could give us any indication of when the amendments might be available so that people can actually see what the proposals are. Uh, well, be stage two. Yeah, uh, clearly, clearly, yeah. <laughs> um, in order to take evidence, I mean, the problem that we have, I think, with this bill is originally it was going to be an amendment at stage two to criminal justice, then it came forward as a standalone bill, and now it's going to be significantly amended again at stage two. It makes it difficult to actually have to consult properly on what the bill is going to look like. So uh, would you be amenable, in fact, to have an extension of stage one or indeed an extended stage two so that the committee can take evidence on the actual proposals? Well, if you, if you look at there are there are two aspects to this. Uh, the general principles of the bill haven't changed. That is the uh, ending of automatic early release for long-term prisoners. The time frame that was originally set was also that the time frame for uh, the different groups was four years for those sex offenders and 10 years for those who were uh, 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 for other uh, non-sexual crimes but were long-term uh, uh, prisoners. That's been brought down to 4-4 four, four for a consistency of approach. I accept in principle if you are going to take away automatic early release for long-term prisoners that it is better to do that on a consistent basis. So. The general principles haven't changed the time uh, line in terms of bringing it down to 4-4. Four, four. 
uh, has changed. So that's uh, quite a straightforward, direct change to it. Um, the issue about the second aspect is the issue around uh, providing a period of guaranteed supervision. This is reflective of the evidence that you have received at stage one and the views that the committee expressed to me when I was before the committee on this issue and I said I was open to looking at providing a period of guaranteed supervision uh, that could uh, take place. So uh, that, uh, again, is a change to the bill. Um, uh, I would debate whether it's a significant change, um, uh, but in my view, it's a change to the bill which I think is appropriate for us to consider. And if at the stage one report, uh, the committee recommend a particular approach to how that guaranteed period of supervision should be taken forward, then I'll reflect on that and then respond to the committee's report on it. If the committee wish further time at stage two to take further evidence on that, then um, that would be a matter for the committee to, to put forward. I think the, the, the problem for some of the witnesses last week was that if the compulsory post-release supervision was tagged on at the end of the sentence, um, that there could be some sort of human rights issues around that rather than being part of the sentence. This is the issue about the, the, the option A and the option B. Uh, and there was some, you know, there's, no, there's been no uh, clarity yet about the minimum period of the compulsory post-release supervision and so on. So there actually is a need to take evidence around those issues. That they, I would argue those are, and I, certainly from what the witnesses were saying last week, those are not insignificant changes. That's their view of the matter. Um, I take a slightly different view of it uh, from them. And I'm conscious that some of the witnesses don't support the idea of ending automatic early release in it, it per se. But I, that, that's, that's, that's for their view. But I... I'm, uh, I'm uh, you know, more than happy if the committee want to take, if the committee are wanting to consider taking further evidence at stage two, that's a matter for the committee to, uh, to, 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 to pursue. Uh, my view is that the issue around um, creating a period of either six or three months at the end of a, a sentence, um, uh, that could potentially be within the sentence period um, as well, is something which we can, uh, I'm more than happy to explore with the committee. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not for me to say to the committee, I don't think you should take more time at stage two. Uh, that's clearly in the gift of the committee. And I think it'd be inappropriate for me to actually say, well, no, I don't think the committee should, shouldn't have sufficient time to do that. I appreciate that it, it, it's quite important to see what it is the government's proposing so that we, okay. that we can take evidence of it. We do need to, to have the substance of your, the proposals well, of your changes. With all due respect, you've been around this place for as long as I have been as well, sort of idea, and there's been uh, amendments brought forward at stage two that committees have had to deal with at that particular point. I have saw uh, even more significant changes take place at stage two in bills without any extra period of uh, 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 evidence taking on it. So I, I'm, what I'm saying is that if the committee, given what we are proposing to do, feel they need more time uh, to consider the matter, that's a matter for the committee. It's not for me to direct the committee in that matter. I appreciate that these things have happened before. Indeed, I've argued myself against my own government in trying to do such things, things at stage two. But it, it's not actually ideal, though, is it, in terms of consultation, in terms of getting the, getting the views of, of stakeholders? Well, that's, if things that's, I, I, but that, 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 that's one point of view. I think it's very reasonable that I've come along to committee at stage one. You've flagged up concerns about the idea of cold release. You've said that you think there should be some form, or you've indicated you feel there should be some form of supervision um, uh, towards the end of a, a prisoner's sentence if we end automatic early release. And I've responded to the committee saying, I'm prepared to do that. And we're looking at, well, that's done within the existing sentence uh, and how that would be managed. And I've said to the committee, if you feel that guarantee period should be a minimum of six months or three months, then I'm more than content to, uh, to listen to the committee's views on that matter. So I'm, I'm responding to concerns that the committee have flagged up, which I think is a perfectly reasonable thing for me to do. Presumably there will be a revised financial memorandum as well. Any changes to it would have to be considered on that. So, you know, whether there will need to be any changes to it um, is dependent on the approach that we actually take. I think, Cabinet Secretary, one of the issues is the use of the word guarantee as opposed to compulsory. Uh, and I think the, one of the difficulties in terms of a technical thing is that if one is to fulfil the entire sentence to say we guarantee supervision at the end, it doesn't mean you have to do it. 
because it's not compulsory. And I think that's the issue that we're, we're finding difficult and that it, it would be more likely to have to be within the time frame of the sentence itself, like a 10-year sentence with, say, perhaps nine and a half years and six months of compulsory supervision. I think that's the issue mm. for us, that you can't just inter interchange those two words. Mm. Well, you know, clearly for the committee, if they were to come back with the view that they feel it should be a, a compulsory period of community supervision towards the end of their sentence, which was three or six months, then, you know, I'd be more than happy to consider that particular review. The problem would be if you said you complete your sentence and then there's something compulsory, that becomes a sentence as well. I think that's the difficulty that we're, we're struggling with. Well, that would have to be... respecting that you've taken a different tack, perhaps, from the previous Cabinet Secretary, which is your, your entitlement. Well, of course, but, uh, you know, if you were... You know, it's worth keeping in mind, this is to deal with a, 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 a select group of prisoners. There are, so there are those who will receive parole release... Um, uh, uh, prior to the end of their sentence, uh, which they're entitled to apply for after they've completed half of their sentence. There'll be those who will also have an extended sentence, which has been imposed at the time when their sentence has been handed down. Uh, and then there's that group you then have left who have not qualified for parole, but are coming towards the end of their sentence, and it's about reintegrating them back into the community and what that should look like in the form of whether it's compulsory or guaranteed period of community supervision. I think, I think that's the issue, as I've said, because some might, just as we've given in evidence, would serve the sentence, come out cold, and you say, well, you're guaranteeing me supervision, but I didn't want it, and I don't have to take it. I think that's just the issue for us, perhaps. Um, I've got Christian. With a couple of questions. First it's of moved. all, uh, the, the... Just move to over there, that's all. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a couple of questions. Thank you, Commander. Uh, the first one is, is the point that you made. Uh, you said that nobody... Uh, uh, you, 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 you were concerned when people were objecting to the automatic early release. Uh, the evidence we took last week... I think victim support cotton was very clear, support the ending of automatic early release. And I ask every panel, uh, every member of, of the panel, and the highway didn't answer, who either supported it. So can I maybe push you on this? Who do you think doesn't support? Sorry if I've misinterpreted it yeah. in the view that if, you know, if they're all supportive of ending automatic early release, they may just have different views on how you should go about achieving that. Um, and they don't agree with the approach which we are uh, taking. Uh, but um, uh, of course, they're entitled to review in that matter. Talking about the approach, and that's my, my, my second question. What I would like reassurance on is that we don't end up like the custodial sentences and weapons Scotland bill, where uh, the principle were good, and I think everybody agreed as, as, uh, that the principle of automatic early release is good. The, but it's questionable the language. Uh, it's on a sound footing, but where the flaws were on the custodial sentences and, and weapons Scotland bill, where the flaws were in the details. So can we have some reassurance this morning uh, from you that uh, we won't change any more the scope of the bill, but that stage two will be really to, uh, uh, to, to focus on the details of what's been debated this morning so far? Well... What, what, of course, when the, when the committee published their, um, uh, your stage one report, we will respond to the issues that have been flagged up um, uh, uh, within the committee's report, and uh, we will then look at how we will amend the bill at stage two. If there are particular aspects and how we respond to it that the committee uh, uh, feel that it requires a bit more time to consider these issues, as I, I mentioned, um, uh, I'm... Uh, to you know, Elaine Murray, I'm, I, that's a matter for the committee if it wants to then look at that specifically and given what the, the government's saying its response is going to be to it, uh, to take some more evidence in the matter. But I, um, uh, you know, uh, the general principles, anything we take forward has to fit within the terms of the bill. Uh, so uh, the principle of ending automatic early release is not changing. Um, what we are looking at as an issue, what we have said is we're going to bring the threshold down uh, for non non crimes of the non-sexual nature. Um, uh, and we're also minded to take an approach uh, that reflects the concerns that have been highlighted about the idea of cold releases uh, that the committee raised with me when I was before you the last time. Just for safety, 
question. It's a matter for the committee to ask the Bureau to give us extended time, perhaps, whatever we decide to do, whether it's to just do a report at stage one and flag up these concerns and look for a longer stage two with evidence. It's up to us to approach the Bureau. And we've got some members of the Bureau on here, so they understand and they're listening. Um, can I now have, um, sorry, is that you? Gil, please. Followed by Margaret, followed by Alison. Yes, Gil. it's a follow-up on that. that one of the um, main criticism, uh, I would say, is the, uh, would the prison service be able to cope in regards to resources? And if, uh, if indeed they do need resources, will, will they be put in place? Uh, if there's going to be bigger numbers uh, uh, that are requiring uh, supervision. Well, the evidence that you uh, received, I think it was last week from the SPS or the week before, was that there's a timeline for how uh, the ending of automatic elder release will start to impact on um, uh, prisoner numbers. So that's um, a number of years uh, ahead. It takes several years before this actually works through into the system. Uh, the other thing I would say on this particular issue around prisoner numbers is that um, I, I don't see the whole issue of dealing with prison numbers in isolation, that um, all we're going to do is something around ending automatic early release. I think there's more we need to do around uh, short-term sentences um, uh, to make sure they're being delivered much more effectively. I think if we look at the churn of prisoners uh, that go through a prison estate uh, for short-term sentences, it takes up a massive amount of the prison services resource and the evidence shows that they are not very effective in being able to address offending behaviour. So we need to look at how we can improve that approach going forward. There's already measures that have taken place over recent years around different types of disposals, uh, uh, presumption against three months, sense of less than three months, all of these measures which are trying to address some of these issues. And um, uh, one of the things that I'm looking at just now uh, within government uh, is to look at how we can, um, how we can take some of these measures uh, further. Uh, in order to make sure that we are uh, not spending uh, as much time with a churn of prisoners in short-term sentences that the outcomes for which are very poor. Uh, uh, and, of course, those that have to go to prison should, but there are continuing to send individuals who could better be addressed, uh, their needs could be better be addressed through community disposal. So we've got several years um, uh, to take forward some of these measures before the impact of any change to automatic early release will actually start to feed into the overall prisoner numbers. And that's something that I want to look at in the, in the whole rather than in isolation. Yeah. I, I, I'm a great supporter of uh, programmes. Uh, you know, I, in my, I was the uh, vice convener on men's violence against women and children. The work that was being done, particularly in Peterhead, it was uh, world-renowned, actually. And uh, I would anticipate since people, I, I would anticipate that there will be a, a, a desire for people who are serving, uh, particularly uh, people who have been involved in serious crime, uh, serious uh, sexual offences, that they may well want to participate in the programmes in Peterhead. Again, I, not from the prison service, I may add, they seem to say that they'll be able to cope uh, with whatever uh, is decided uh, but that's maybe civil service speak so what, what I'm asking you uh, uh, Minister is if that I'm right uh, that there would be more people that would uh, perhaps volunteer because it's a voluntary system uh, uh, that this was in, in Peter Ed but more folk volunteer and even although they volunteer for maybe the wrong reasons uh, not, not the right reasons I uh, the right reasons to address their their behaviour, and it's the, the, these programmes are so, so successful. But I believe that if they do engage, then they, even those who do it for the wrong, what I'm calling the wrong reasons, would benefit from it. So I'm, I'm just I just want to uh, be assured, uh, or if you were you assure yourself that resources would be available in, in these circumstances, where I think as late night follows day, there will be an increase of numbers. It might be minimum, but uh, it's a good programme. I wouldn't like to see it disturbed because there's uh, more coming in and not being able to, to benefit from it. 
I think um, you raise a good point in terms of uh, access to programmes, which we touched on uh, earlier in the review work that's presently been taken forward within the Scottish Prison Service to look at how they can improve the way in which they deliver their um, uh, their uh, programmes and their rehabilitation programmes as well. And I think there was a STOP programme that you were referring to at Peterhead that had um, a, a, a significant reputation for how it worked with uh, sex offenders. I, I know that the evidence that you received um, from the uh, Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service was saying that uh, they would see that the current uptake of sex offenders programmes, which is approximately 50%, uh, would uh, increase to around 67% uh, with the ending of automatic early release. And I think that's why it's important that the review programme of work that they are taking forward just now is about looking at how they can make sure that the way in which they deliver these programmes with increasing demand is much more tailored to that individual prisoner's needs in order to address them much more uh, effectively. Um, uh, there's no doubt it's going to be challenging, but our part to that is that uh, within the prison system, there's a very, very sizable part of the resource is taken up in dealing with the churn of short-term prisoners, um, uh, which draws resource away from tackling some of these issues because of that churn in the system. So it's about trying to get that balance right. So, um, uh, so some of the things that we are looking at, uh, uh, at going forward around how we can be much more effective with short-term prisons prisoners and uh, much more effective programmes in dealing with that. Uh, uh, and also, at the same time, making sure that the resource that's necessary for those programmes for long-term prisoners are able to be delivered in a much more individualised uh, way. So there's a, a number of things that have to be done in the system in order to achieve that. But you know, one of the uh, uh, one of the important aspects, as was highlighted by Henry McLeish in his report, is that prisons should be used uh, much more effectively for those who should actually be there. Uh, uh, and where it's appropriate for them to be there. And I think this bill and some of the other policies that we're going to be taking forward will help to achieve getting that balance much more effectively. Thanks for that. That's Margaret. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Um, you've mentioned, Cabinet Secretary, that one of the reasons for, for moving um, and changing uh, the, the proposal in the bill was consistency. But surely it would be consistency to include short-term sentences and abolish automatic early release for them as well? Well, in this bill, we've uh, set out that we're going to do it for long-term prisoners, and it's within the confines of this bill that that can be achieved um, uh, as well. Uh, you'll also be aware that um, it, before uh, abolishing the ending of automatic early release for short-term prisoners, is that the Independent Prison Commission recommended there's a whole range of other things that would need to be taken forward before that could be achieved. For example, dealing with the whole issue of the churn of short-term prisoners, uh, 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 more in the way of community disposals, all of these different measures that would need to be taken forward. Now, some of that work's already started, and some of it we need to accelerate further on as well, and that's what I'm looking at doing as well. Once we're in a position to take that forward, then um, I'm content to then look at the issue of uh, ending automatic early release for short-term prisoners as well. But we're not at that point, as uh, was highlighted by the Independent Prison uh, Commission. And once we are at that particular point, then we can revisit the issue of automatic early release for short-term prisoners. Wouldn't it be better if it's public safety and we know the, the highest percentage of people who re-offend um, and um, who end up back in the system are short-term sentence prisoners, wouldn't it be better to end automatically early at least while still looking at disposals and doing um, the evaluation of whether a community sentence is more appropriate, uh, looking better at how these short-term sentences uh, prisoners are being looked at just now because through care isn't there. We hear about it all the time, but it just isn't in prisons every day people are being released without having the through care that's um, necessary to, to help them um, not re-offend. I don't think it's possible um, um, competent within this bill because the purpose of the bill is an act of the Scottish Parliament to end the right of certain long-term prisoners I, to automatic early release. So I understand it couldn't that. be done in the bill. So what I'm suggesting, really, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and I think the round table 
uh, panel were quite, I would say, a majority in the view of this, this should be scrapped. And we should look at bringing it forward perhaps in the Criminal Justice Bill where we can look at the automatic early release of all prisoners being abolished and starting to get down to providing the rehabilitation, which again in evidence we heard far uh, demand for which um, for these rehabilitation programmes far outweighs supply in prison, that we start getting to what happens to prisoners um, what their experience is to try and ensure that prison does actually rehabilitate, which would have the stated aim of protecting the par par uh, public and provide clarity and transparency in sentencing. Okay, um, well, there's a the whole range of different issues in there. Um, the first thing I would say is that I think it's wrong to say there's no through care in prisons. Um, uh, now, it may be that there are uh, areas where it still needs to improve, and I know there is work being taken forward to uh, to achieve that, but it is simply wrong to say there's no through care. I've witnessed it, saw, um, saw it first hand in a range of different areas um, uh, where through care is uh, delivered, and the Scottish Prison Service have also uh, 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 given a commitment to 42 uh, through care officers who are going to have that responsibility. Prison officers about supporting and working with the different agencies in prisoners moving from prison into the community as well. Um, uh, these things take time. Um, but I do think it is convenient and important to put that on the record that there is a significant amount of work that is undertaken by our prison officers, sometimes in very difficult circumstances, working with prisoners who come from very difficult backgrounds uh, to deliver as effective through care as they can. Um, but sometimes that's not always uh, achieved as well as it could because the prison service can't deliver it on their own. Uh, they need partnerships with other agencies and some of the work which I'm taking forward in the ministerial uh, group on uh, tackling reoffending is all around the issue about through care, housing, health, all the parts that they have to play in helping to make sure through care is delivered much more effectively for prisoners. The second aspect is an issue about um, one about uh, ending uh, automatic LREs for short term uh, prisoners, notwithstanding that it's not competent within this particular bill itself. The other part uh, uh, to this, as I've said, is that the uh, Independent Commission in uh, Prisons looked at this issue in detail and recommended there's a whole range of, area, uh, range of measures that have to be taken forward before you could achieve that uh, in order to take it forward. And some of that sort of work's already started, and as I've already indicated, I want to look at how we can exhilarate some of that uh, further uh, on. And the part, part of that as well is that um, when... Uh, when you raise the issue of about uh, rehabilitating people and protecting the public, there's no doubt that prisons have got an important part to play in, uh, in protecting the public. We also have to look at the evidence base in short-term prisons uh, sentences. And the evidence base shows that very often short-term prison sentences are not effective in tackling offending behaviour. And we need to make sure that the approach that we do take has that evidence base too around tackling offending behaviour. And that's one of the things that I'm keen to do. It is one of the things I made very clear at the time when I decided not to go ahead with Inverclyde Prison, is that we need to make sure that the model and the approach we take is much more effective in tackling offending behaviour, rather than the revolving door of people getting in and out of prisons eh, and expecting the prison in a short period of time to be able to turn that individual situation completely around and their community situation completely around. It's entirely unrealistic to expect that. So if we want to do that, what we need to do is we need to look at what is the best way in which to deliver these types of short-term sentences. Some of them will be in prison, others may be with their community at disposal, and we need to make sure we're doing that in a consistent way that's got better outcomes that assists us in reducing re-offending. So, um, these are big issues uh, within uh, penal policy in itself, but I think it would be it would be far too simplistic just to think that if we end automatic early release for all short-term prisoners, provide just a wee bit more rehabilitation or even a significant bit more rehabilitation in our prisons, that we will be able to deal with these things much more effectively. The evidence shows us that's not the best way to go about doing this. It's about taking forward disposals that are much more effective in tackling offending behaviour. And that means using community disposals in a number of ways that deliver that more effectively. 
Can I ask if it's the Cabinet Secretary's intention to, just for clarification, because I don't think it was clear from your evidence this morning, to propose at stage to a, a minimum period of this guaranteed um, supervision, uh, an actual amendment at stage two, so we can see what the government is proposing? Well, I've listened to the views that the committee have already expressed on this matter, and obviously we'll get the stage one report with what the committee is recommending in this issue. We'll reflect on that, but I uh, recognise the concerns that have been raised by the committee about the idea of cold release, uh, and I'm prepared to look at whether it's a guaranteed or a compulsory period um, of supervision that has to be provided at the end of the sentence. Um, I'm uh, prepared to bring forward an amendment in order to achieve that, um, uh, given the concerns that the committee have raised. The final detail of that will be reflective of the concerns and issues that have been raised by the committee in its stage one report. We're having a debate here about guaranteed and compulsory. Presumably, if it's within the sentence period, it's guaranteed. And if it's posted, it's not only guaranteed, it's compulsory. Well, because was, you'll have finished your sentence. Yeah, if it was going to be provided yeah. uh, uh, over and above uh, the sentence that's handed down by the courts, it would have to be an extended sentence. Uh -huh. That's right. So, but obviously it's compulsory if you're if you're still got your sentence. It's in the middle of it. It's obviously it's still compulsory. So just to get these two words clear in my head, um, and you're looking at me as if I haven't there, John, but I have. I have. Very clear in my head. Alison. Um, Minister, I acknowledge that you've acted in good faith in, in responding to what, what the committee said earlier on. Um, but if the period of, of compulsory supervision is in itself part of the sentence rather than subsequent to it, is this not? how would you respond to the point that this is actually only automatic early release by some other name and it's really just a rebranding? Well, I think it's unfair to say it would be rebranding it in that sense because automatic early release for a long-term prisoner is at two-thirds of their sentence, no matter what the circumstances are. Uh, there's no control over that period of time whatsoever. Uh, as to when, so that certainly won't be the case. Now, what we are uh, prepared to do is to give the powers to the, the parole board to be able to determine what that period of compulsory or guaranteed period of supervision should actually be, given the individual's circumstances. Right now, the parole board are absolutely powerless uh, to stop anybody who qualifies for automatic early release. Uh, so it would give them the power to be able to determine that, um, uh, which puts them in a position where they've got more control over what's happening. And, if you, and also the supervision measures that are put in place for that individual. And if you look at the data that I offered to Roddy Campbell earlier on, it just demonstrates the marked difference that it can actually have uh, in the outcomes for uh, a prisoner in breaching their uh, supervision. So we're extending the powers of the parole board to, make, to be able to make that determination as to what that period should actually it be towards the end of their sentence, uh, so it removes the automatic element of it. That's helpful. And, and during that period, that, this hypothetical um, compulsory supervisionary period, would there be a power of recall? Yes, there would be. There would be. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Miss Murray pressed you on the financial memo, and you said, "Well, oh, you might update it." But surely, in, in considering uh, these issues, you must have considered what the financial resource implications would be. And have you had discussions with, say, Social Work Scotland about your revised proposals? Well, I think it's worth keeping in mind it is a very small number of prisoners that we are talking about uh, that this would affect, and also it's several years into the future before any of this starts, starts to actually have an impact. The danger is that you start to put some limits on it just now, thinking it in five or six years' time, uh, that's what you actually require. So, yes, if there is a need for uh, some additional resource going forward, we, are, of course, will be alive to that and we'll look to address that. But I, I think it would be, um, um, I think it's about getting the balance right. So, yes, if there's a need for additional resource going forward, which, as I say, will be a number of years ahead, then we will look at that. But I. As also I've mentioned as well, it's about the balance in the system, about the amount of resource we've also got tied up dealing with short-term offenders and the churn of short-term offenders. Some of that resource may actually be better directed in dealing with some of the issues around at the end of a sentence. So um, it may be about reallocating of existing resource uh, once we start to get that balance much more effective. Thank you, Convener. Not at all. Jane, followed by John, followed by Christian. Um, 
Cabinet Secretary, it's clear from what we've heard this morning that these, some of these topics are, are quite complex and interconnected. Um, and I note that the, the Scottish Sentencing Council is going to be set up, so I wonder if there's any benefit from just waiting to hear from them about the impact of, of, of these reforms on, on sentencing policy? Um, well, the, the Scottish Sentencing Council will be uh, up and running October, November this uh, year, um, uh, and they will obviously then develop their own programme of work. I, I'm not entirely sure what the benefit of that would be other than to delay uh, uh, taking this forward and then uh, what benefit would be gained from that. As a government, we've made it very clear we're ending automatic early release for long-term prisoners. And, uh, we intend to take that forward. It may be the, the Sentencing Council will want to look at things like the use of extended sentences, etc., uh, going forward in their work, but I'm, uh, I'm not entirely persuaded that there would be any benefit in doing that uh, and delaying this bill to allow them to look at the issue other than just to delay taking things forward. And I suspect that there would be many victims who would find that difficult to understand. Um, why that you've got a bill in the stocks before Parliament that could end automatically or at least that we decide to delay it for an indeterminate period of time. I think everyone's agreed that transparency of sentencing is very important. And so I just was really trying to just clarify if there's an ongoing interaction between this bill and, and the work of the Sentencing Council, but um, I'd like your views on that. Well, well, not at the moment on the basis that it's not up and running as yet. So um, um, I've got no doubt, I think the Scottish Sentencing Council you know, can play an important part to play in uh, sentencing policy in the years to come. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, and we'll, 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 we'll prove to, to, to provide that type of invaluable uh, uh, insight. But clearly, once, once it's up and running and it's operating, uh, then, you know, we'll be engaging with it in, a, uh, in an ongoing basis. John. Uh, afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Afternoon. Uh, firstly, I welcome your acknowledgement about the cold release aspect and, and your, your encouragement for greater use of non-custodial disposals and the resource that's tied up, um, uh, the shift that can take place with that. You've made mention on a number of occasions of the Independent Commission on Prisons, um, and as a number of colleagues have said, Cabinet Secretary, there's a number of issues overlap here. I wonder, and I note what you've said in relation to awaiting receipt of the Stage 1 report before obviously coming up with uh, amendments, would it be possible um, to get a copy of where things stand with the Scottish Government at the moment with regard to each of the proposals of the Independent Commissioner, uh, Commission on Prisons, just to see where this sits in relation to everything else? Of course, we can provide the committee with a response to that. OK, well, thank you very much. Uh, Christian. I just wanted to go back on Thanks. a particular point by Margaret uh, uh, put forward, which was the question that some people in evidence last week did uh, uh, ask for the bill to be scrapped. They all came back afterwards uh, uh, at the end of the evidence when they heard from uh, uh, the, the, the victim supports. And that's very, very clear. I, I would like you maybe to, to tell us uh, what you thinking on stage two to get that balance right between the right of the families of victims and between the, uh, the, the process that we've got to go through for, for, for this bill. Because I, I kind of think that it's, it's not been addressed too much this morning. Well, in terms of um, uh, trying to get the balance right, that's why um, uh, I've already indicated to the committee that I, I want to see uh, all uh, automatic early release for long-term prisoners to come to an end. So there's a consistent approach there. There's a transparency to that. There is no staged approach for uh, 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 crimes of a non-sexual nature uh, that have a long-term sentence. So there's a consistency of approach, uh, which I think is important from a victim's uh, perspective um, as well. The other aspect to that is about um, uh, the evidence that shows us that um, uh, uh, the supervised uh, release of prisoners um, helps to reduce very significantly uh, the risk of those individuals um, breaching their supervision. Uh, and the impact, obviously, if someone's breaching it, could be committing an offence that then has an impact on victims. So the bit about having that um, guaranteed period of supervision at the end as well is about reducing the risk of that individual going back into the community and potentially uh, committing further offences. 
uh, and to have that managed in a way that allows them, for example, to be recalled as and when necessary, um, should that occur. Again, it's about helping to protect the public um, uh, as well. So those, uh, I think, an ending automatically the release uh, and uh, the transparency that creates, having it equalised at four years across the offences and also uh, that guaranteed period of supervision um, uh, towards the end of the sentence, I believe helps to provide victims with greater transparency and also uh, offer greater public protection. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes... Oh, I thought you were wanting me to move on. Right, Roddy, yes. Very small point. Just uh, on the question of through care, you, you talked about the uh, operation of through care officers. This bill deals with uh, um, long-term offenders uh, serving sentences of four years or more. Uh, I'm correct, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I believe that statutory through care applies to prisoners serving sentences of four years or more. Yes. yes. Uh, it's also worth keep. I know, just but it's, I'm it, to the record. It, yes. it's, it, convenience helpfully reminded me of another part of the bill that hasn't been explored in great detail, and that's the ability for the prison service to be able to vary the release by two days. That, but, the, but, but it's a very good example of where the prison service have flagged up the difficulties they have in through care because it was so rigid. So it's a reflection of trying to address some of these issues uh, within the legislation as well to help to improve through care for a long time and so we are very happy with that because it's been a very practical issue that we've come across. I want to conclude this evidence session. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And if I may, Cabinet Secretary, I'm just going to continue on to the next item while you're moving because um, it's time pressures. Uh, item four, subordinate legislation. It's three negative instruments. This is what I wanted to This is what I thought you wanted to move on to because you were not. Uh, the next item is going to three negative incidents. The first is the Firefighters' Pension Scheme Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015-19, provides for a reform pension scheme for firefighters in Scotland. The Delegate Powers and Law Reform Committee agreed not to draw the attention of the Parliament to this instrument. Do any members have any comments in relation to it? John. It's a comment to say what, what a disappointing state of affairs that we, ha we, we have moved to this, this, uh, this new scheme. I know that there are interim arrangements, but, uh, and I know it's out with the control of this place, but I, I think that's worth saying. I think I share your concerns <coughs> that your comp the, com the retirement age is, as I understand, it, apart from the interim measure 60, which seems to mean certain kinds of professions, you be very difficult to fulfil your job physically. Uh, up to that age, notwithstanding some of us who are approaching 60 um, are still able to do it. I knew that would make you smile. Um, apart from that, do members have any other comments in relation to this instrument? Yes? It was a recall. I think we all agree on that. But, uh, Thank you very uh, much. Uh, yes. So you make no recommendation in relation to this instrument, apart from that observation. Second negative instrument we are considering today is the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service Procedure for Appointment of Members Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, oblique 53. Sets out the procedure for selection and nomination for appointment for members of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Again, the DPLR Committee agreed not to draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument. Do you have any comments in relation to this? Are you content with it? Content. Uh, the final negative instrument is the Scottish Administration Offices Order 2015, SSI 2015, Bleak 200. It specifies the clerk and deputy clerk, the Sheriff Appeal Court as offices in the Scottish Administration, which are not ministerial offices for the purposes of the Scotland Act 1998. These are new offices and are to be office holders in the Scottish Administration the same way as the existing posts of Sheriff Clark and Sheriff Clark Deputy are such offices. The DPR committee agreed not to draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument. Do members have any comments? Nope. No comments, <laughs> thank you. You're content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument. Thank you. We now move into private session.